Trade has certain static and dynamic um, and benefits. Um, I mean, we talked about scale economies, but I think really important is also the dynamic um, possibility um, of learning, productivity, upgrading, and structural transformation um, through through trade. But as we also all know, um, trade in itself does not lead to economic growth, upgrading, or structural transformation. So the important question is not whether, but how to participate in, in trade, um, global and, and regional. And I think this links very well to the discussion we had earlier, that it's not only about trade facilitation that is very important, but also about improving the value added um, trade and changing the structure of the economies. Um, so to specifically talk about the how to integrate and how to increase value added, it's important to see that there have been major changes um, in the global economy that impact global trade but also regionally trade. And I want to highlight two of these um, changes. Um, one is the shift from trade in final to an increasing importance um, of intermediate goods and supply chain relationships. And this has 
several drivers. I mean, one is the policy change of lead firms. I mean, lead firms that govern such chains, um, they, since the 80s or so, increasingly focused on outsourcing. That means they focused on their core competences and other activities they don't see as their core competency as bringing high rents, high value added. They outsource to other independent firms, but they still manage the production of these activities very um, closely. And it's also related to a change in development policy of many developing countries with a stronger focus on export orientation, which also made capacities available. And for sure, trade liberalization and transaction and transport costs played an important role in this shift in, in how trade is done. So the result is that we see that a large majority of trade is done within global value chains. There are different estimates, but these are sources from the WTO and the UNCTAD, the estimate between two-thirds and 80% of global trade is done within um, global value chains. And related to this, intermediate goods trade has increased importantly, being more than half of global trade. Um, and global value chains are predominant in manufacturing and services, but also in other sectors, like resource sectors, agricultural, minerals, they play an important role. And this importance of global value chains um, has crucial policy implications. I mean, it's not necessary anymore to produce whole final goods or develop whole sectors, but you can focus on certain activities, capabilities, and integrate in value chains. And this brings opportunities, but also challenges. Because lead firms, as I said before, they outsource specific activities which are normally lower value added and where you can create or where there is quite a strong competition between different supplier countries and supplier firms. So there's the danger that in these activities there's high competition and the so-called fallacy of competition. And we can, for example, see this and we look at the last 20 years in the development of prices for low and medium tech products that they have been declined because many developing countries have entered these areas, have also upgraded to medium tech activities, but because there's this competition, prices still um, have declined. So this really points out to the important issue that it's important to enter global value chains, and this is quite difficult in itself, yeah, because the requirements of lead firms with regard to costs or quality or lead times are quite strict. But it's also important to change your position in value chains and to improve the value added and reach so-called upgrading. And this is a huge policy issue, but it's important to, so, to secure um, sustainable um, and development effects. So this is one important change. Um, the second one we also discussed already in the, in the morning um, is that there are shifts in, in end markets. I mean, one important is the role of emerging countries as new growth drivers and, and new end markets. And just for example, in Asia, that uh, more than 50% of merchandise final products not intermediates, they go now to developing country markets. So that's quite a, quite a big change. Um, and we also see this in Africa, that there has been a huge shift in end markets, as we discussed earlier, where it's also very much focused on commodities. Yeah? I mean, it also has led to a commodification and, and deindustrialization, um, these shift in end markets. Um, another thing is the expansion of interregional trade, which is the topic of, of, of this meeting. And what is important, as we discussed, is for sure the, the high potential of higher incomes and the middle class um, in, in African countries, also regional trade agreements. But I think what is also important and has not really been discussed is the, the flexibility and geographical proximity that has become more important in value chains. Costs are still important, but lead times, flexibility, proximity have become quite important. So you see that in many countries you have regional and um, global suppliers, also developing in, in African countries. Um, and I think I don't have to go through this, we discussed this already, um, that even so when you look at this picture, it's 2011, the latest, latest date here, um, is regional integration or intra-regional trade um, in Africa is, is more limited compared to, to, to other regions in the world. But as we already discussed, I mean, there is quite an important improvement, and there are also huge country differences. I mean, this is a bit different than the, the 10 to 12 percent um, we discussed in the morning, because here looked, it's not correctly labeled, that all trade from Sub-Saharan Africa to other African countries, so it, it includes also North Africa. And this is by, by 16 16 percent. What we also see here is the huge increase of exports to developing Asia, um, from 16 percent to 36 
um, percent here from 96, 2000 to 2012, 2014. And the decline in developed Europe and developed Mer America, as you pointed out um, um, earlier. So I don't have to go into detail. Um, interestingly, East, as we all know, the East African community is um, the, the I mean, uh, most developed with regard to intra-regional trade. And here you stated someone here 22 to 23% inter-ERC trade. Here also included Ethiopia and looked at the exports to all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's quite substantial. I mean, it's 34%, which is quite substantial. If you look at all Sub-Saharan Africa, not just, uh, so it's, it's, it's even higher. We don't have to look at, uh, this is wrong, this should be Southern Africa. Um, and for specific countries, as was pointed out earlier, it's even higher. I mean, for Kenya, and this is 2011 data, and I think it's 53% it's, it's as, as one um, participant mentioned in the morning. Um, Interregional trade used to be 42%, and it's also high for Rwanda and Uganda. And as we know, these are only the formal data. So if you look at informal trade and the data you cited in the morning, 60%, it's, it's much, much more important. So clearly, there is potential for improvement, but there have been large developments. But it's regional and also country specific and there are huge, huge differences. Um, coming to, to the next point, industrialization and global value chain dynamics. I mean, there is an increased focus, I think, um, fortunately now, again on structural transformation and industrialization, which is specifically important in Sub-Saharan Africa which we see that it's quite the economic structure, um, not very diversified. Um, I think it's important in this discussion to go beyond manufacturing. I mean, for sure, manufacturing has certain characteristics, like economies of scale, like certain productivity, that are important from an economic growth um, and perspective and linkages, possibilities, etc. But also other sectors like services, agro-processing, or linkages from the mining sector have such activities. So I think it's important to look at manufacturing services and also at commodity sectors for possibilities for structural um, transformation. And services, as we will probably hear more later, they are in itself important sectors, but they are also crucially important support sectors for all other economic activities, um, as, we, as we already have discussed. Um, I want to point out five major issues with regard to, to value chains um, and, 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 and trade and also industrialization and upgrading. Um, I mean, for sure, there are very different value chain types um, with their own characteristics, but I think you can still um, differentiate two families, like these vertically specialized value chains and additive value chains. Vertically specialized are um, concentrated like in manufacturing and, and service sectors. The process is very much fragmented. The different steps can take place in parallel. And to end the chains, the challenge is often to focus on specific capabilities. So maybe thin out to to answer value chains, but later on it's also the question of increasing value aid and, and thicken out, as, as you can say. But it needs specific policies. On the other side, additive value chains that are still quite important in, in Africa are dominant in resource sectors. And there the crucial question is the question of backward and forward linkages. How can you improve local and even more important regional value added by sourcing more locally, regionally, and doing more processing activities um, locally um, and, and regionally? So it's largely a question about sequencing of policies and different types of policies um, you need. A second important point is Trade does not just take place. It has never been the case, and even less when we look about value chains. Trade is governed, and it's governed by certain types of lead firms. And they have very important um, um, impact on who can enter chains and also who can upgrade in these chains and how benefits and risks and costs are distributed within chains. Um, and the problem is also that there are quite high often market and also power asymmetries between suppliers and these lead firms. But it's still important to engage with lead firms if you want to be part of value chains, eh? because they are the governors um, um, of, 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 these, of these chains, and it's quite difficult. Um, a point which follows very much from this is that upgrading is essential to meet value chain requirements, to meet lead firm requirements, to stay in chains and enter chains, but also to increase value capture and decrease the benefits of integration in, um, in value chains. And here lead firms, I would say, have quite an ambivalent role. I mean, there are specific sector and country cases, but when we look at the literature over in, um, overall, I mean, they generally support certain types of upgrading. 
if it comes to process upgrading, product upgrading, which improves the productivity of the whole chain, there are often some supplier programs or certain support for upgrading. But they can also block upgrading, and specifically when it comes to um, functional upgrading, and when suppliers want to develop functions that lead from C as their core functions. Um, and um, so, so this is also um, um, a problem where lead firms can, can, can block upgrading. But these functional upgrading and also supply chain upgrading, which is not just doing things better, but doing other and new things, which ideally higher value added, these are the, like the, the most important upgrading functions because this is some of the basis for structural transformation and also industrialization. So it's an ambivalent relationship with lead firms. They can lead to upgrading, they're important, you have to engage with them, but it's also important that you have to try and their policy plays an important role to upgrade even sometimes against the interest of, of, of lead firms. Um, another important point is um, also to upgrading, I want to say it's, it's also quite it's contested but also a moving target. I mean, I can, for example, give the example of the, of the garment or apparel sector where um, lead firms more and more demanded that suppliers don't do assembly only as CMT, but also do like certain design functions, input sourcing. And for this, they got also higher prices. But as more and more countries and firms went into these functions, they are higher valued functions, but if more countries go into these functions, then there's also quite a tough competition and it's somehow the new normal in the, in the global supply chain. So now to enter like directly supply chains in the apparel sector with buyers, um, you need to be an FOB supplier, a full package supplier. It's not enough to do only CMT or assembly. And it doesn't really lead always to higher prices because so many other countries and firms have also developed these, these functions. So upgrading is important, but it's also not one-to-one -one, um, um, with increasing in really income and profits and more security. That's an important, important point. This really relates to what we're discussing here. Different end markets have quite an important um, impact on the potential for upgrading. And that's not just, I mean, for sure it's very important, specifically what I said before, that we drive firms and countries to diversify end markets and diversify lead firms, so that you are less dependent on certain countries and lead firms. But it's also that different end markets have different characteristics and lead firms and different requirements. And they can lead to different upgrading um, and potential and, and possibilities. And I will give uh, next the example of the garment sector, where we'll compare the South African end market with the US end market. And there's quite substantial more upgrading possibility in the South African market, just because of the interest of the lead firm store. Yeah? So it's interesting to, to understand these value chain um, and dynamics. And for sure, also preferential market access plays an important role um, in, the, in the sustainability of access to, to certain markets. And for all this, one conclusion is that value chains also don't just take place in a vacuum, but policy is <coughs> crucially important. I mean, trade policy has a huge impact on how value chains um, look like, how you source inputs from related to rules of origin, but also other policies are really important, like industrial policies, labor market skills, infrastructure. Um, just quickly, I mean, the two families of value chains I pointed out, vertically specialized and regional additive value chains, um, they, they all exist for sure, in, for sure in Africa. But I mean, vertically specialized, I will focus here, focus here on manufacturing. There are quite specific and limited vertically specialized manufacturing um, um, chains that target the US and the EU market, often based on preferential market access. So we see this. But we also see increasingly that there are sophisticated regional markets, specifically South Africa, that are served by uh, manufacturing and value chains. And we see less evidence supplying other thousand markets where there's a focus very much on commodities, as we discussed earlier. With regard to regional additive value chains, um, they are more conducive from the start to linkages to locally regional um, um, and inputs um, um, or processing. But historically, there was very much the focus of importing everything, doing only extraction, and then, then exporting. But there are huge possibilities, and there was also huge discussions in, in last year, specifically related to the commodity price boom, to try to use this price boom, which is not a boom anymore, for um, also transforming commodity sectors and reaching industrialization. And we saw, for example, that several mines have more focus put on local and regional suppliers, related also with supplier development programs and certain also local content um, stipulations in, in certain countries. And regional markets. 
I mean, um, South African supermarkets specifically that source locally and regionally. I mean, in fresh fruit or so, to a certain extent, they have to do it, but it's also really important when these supermarkets expand, um, what else they will source locally and regional, and what they will source through their global um, distribution centers, because this will have a huge Im impact on regional value chains um, and, and, and local and, and regional um, linkages. Um, just one point. I think regional value chains are not just about value chains that have to end market in the region. I mean, that's important, that's, 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 that's um, increasing, and for this you also need regional lead firms, which I think is still a problem. Um, but it's also about regional production networks that then also may imp export like to global markets. Eh? And we see like, in, for example, in Asia, how important regional production networks were. When you look like a, at a laptop or so, where very different components come from regional countries in Asia, and then the final product is exported um, to the US. So also for reaching global end markets, being regionally competitive and, uh, being, uh, and having regional, uh, I mean, to be competitive, regional networks are of increasing importance. Um, this is just what we also discussed before, um, that the share of manufacturing, and this is here, manufacture is quite broadly defined. Yeah, just two more. Quite broadly defined is much higher, as we discussed already, in intra-Sub-Saharan Africa trade than in, in trade um, to the world. We see here 42% and, and 13%. But this is not all done through, I mean, I think only a small part is done through value chains, because when we look at intra-industry trade, that's quite, quite limited in, in sub-Saharan intra-regional um, trade. This is just for East Africa, for Southern Africa. Um, let me just quickly say a few points, because I think my time is, is nearly up, um, on, the, on the apparel sector. Um, I just want to say that this sector increased very much through, through AGOA, but more recently there's a regional um, um, value chain, um, and specifically focusing on a South African, African market. Um, and it's very much focused on thousand African supplier countries. In East Africa, we see quite limited intra-regional trade in the apparel sector. These are the main apparel exporters, but just, oh, no. This is the really interesting figure that shows that regional, sub-Saharan African regional apparel exports are nowadays as high as the individual exports to the EU15 and to the EU 15 enter US, which is really what you see this. Oh, it's quite a huge development. Um, yeah, you cannot see here. So the, you, you, you really see that regional exports to the region have increased quite, quite tremendously. Yeah, sorry. Um, and for some countries, they, they are quite, a, quite a, high, a high share. And what is important here is that these value chains are not only different end markets, but have quite distinct characteristics and upgrading potentials. I mean, the apparel value chain that's based on Agoa, these are largely transnational Asian producers that invested in Kenya, Lesotho, Madagascar, um, Swaziland, uh, Mauritius. And they are based on long run production, basic production to the US. They have production in 10 other countries. And all the higher value added decisions they make in their headquarters in Taiwan or Hong Kong, where they have the direct relationship to, to buyers. So they are not really interested in local sourcing or increasing local value added, because they have this global strategy, and they are here because they, they have a go, or they source textiles and also packaging materials sometimes globally. So in Lesotho, they also import sometimes packaging material, not only yarns and, and all the other inputs. And it's, it's also related to this production model they have. But these regional value chains, they are focused on the South African market and there are quite different types of investors. It's largely South African investors or European investors in Madagascar and Mauritius or Mauritian investors in Madagascar. And they, fulfill, they are part of the more fast fashion segment of the South African market because their long, pro long production they get from China and Bangladesh. So there are more upgrading possibilities. It's also a more, I think, um, sustainable and embedded. It's based on SACO and SADIC, but this is much more sustainable and than, than, than SADIC. So the point is that different value chains, in this case regional and global, and different type of ownership and investor strategies have an important role on upgrading possibilities. And this is important for policy because up to recently, the focus was very much on size, size of employment and exports in, for example, Lesotho or Madagascar or, or, or Kenya. And, and the big transnational producer in Taiwan, they are bigger. But they are not the more dynamic and the more sustainable value chains and the ones that provide more learning opportunities. There are common issues. This is the, the last point um, I make that all of these chains, also the more dynamic ones, they nearly don't use any local inputs. 
And this is a huge issue because we have cotton sec you have cotton sectors, it's all exported, and then there's the missing link of the textile sector, and then all the textile is imported. And this is important to increase local and regional value added, but also to stay competitive regionally and globally. Because why should a retailer source from Southern Africa when he anyways has to get like the, fabri uh, the fabric and the yarns um, from Asia? It's because of Agoa, but Agoa is not sustainable, as we know. And even from, for regional markets, where the focus is on flexibility and speed, it's really important to have like a vertical integrated regional value chain. So it's quite, quite important. Um, my concluding points are four. I think regional value chains can be learning stepping stones into global markets, but also the other way around. Firms can also learn globally and then export regionally and, and domestically. Um, a basic for increased regional value-added linkages and functional upgrading. Important for this is also regional lead firms. And here supermarkets or retailers play an important role in their sourcing policy, how you can make them more regionally embedded. But it's also a basis for competitiveness in global market. And it's often more sustainable and embedded, and it's a buffer to, to global shocks. Regional value chains, as we discussed, require cross-border and what I also think is important, cross-sectoral cooperation. We all discussed the issue of non-trade barriers, of trade barriers, which is regulatory infrastructure issues. But also between sectors, cooperation is really important. For the case of apparel, I mean that the cotton, textile, apparel, and retail sector talk together and initiate policies and together. I mean, this is crucial to have this intra-sectoral coordination. My nearly last point, and this came also up in the discussion before, um, it's not only important to focus on trade facilitation, but also on building productive capacity and supply response. Because only being able to trade easier without having like enterprises that are formal, that are, rather, that are larger, a bit, to be able to use and these trading opportunities is, is quite problematic. So I think there is a huge focus also on industrial policy, which we then probably can discuss um, in, 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 the, in the discussion. Yeah, and the last point, it's important which we talk about policies to always see the link between manufacturing, services, agriculture, and commodities, because there are huge um, possibilities and synergies between these sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. That's quite fascinating insight into the, the world of apparel and where it takes us to in understanding. Now, another sort of uh, aspect that, that's come up so much recently, and in fact, in a lot of my conversations about, uh, about uh, econo sustainable economic growth and uh, understanding barriers and understanding opportunities, is the role that energy plays. If most people will, will say to you that that is the single biggest barrier, whatever you are manufacturing, whatever service you're providing, whatever you are doing to try and make a buck, basically, you have to have a stable, reliable, affordable source of energy. And this is an enormous challenge across Africa, and I believe in East Africa as well. So, Peter, Knizia, you're not going to tell us a bit more about this. Will you stand there or would you sit here? Thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, m my name is uh, Peter Kinuthi. I'm the Senior Energy Officer at the East African Community Secretariat, and I'll be addressing the topic of energy supply and access challenges in East Africa. As uh, has been mentioned, and as we all have been saying since morning, uh, energy is important for contributing to development in the region and anywhere. Any sort of economic activities uh, depend very large on energy. And not just energy, but reliable uh, and uh, cost-effective uh, energy. So in my presentation, I will cover present, uh, an introduction. Uh, I'll look at the energy resources that are available in East Africa, and then the energy uh, projects and programs within the region, and then the challenges, and uh, make some conclusions. I think I'll not say much about the East African community. Much has been said. We are five partner states. We are headquartered in Arusha, and our main mission is widening e economic, political, and social integration 
for value, uh, there is increased, for increased competition, value added production, trade and investment. So we are spot on on the issues that we are discussing in this uh, 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 conference, in this workshop. Briefly, the East African integration process has been uh, alluded to several times. Following the establishment of the East African community in 2000, year 2000, in 2005, we entered into a customs union. In 2010, we moved to the common market. In 2013, the heads of state signed the monetary union protocol and is now in the implementation phase uh, of a 10-year implementation program uh, that will lead to establishment of a common currency. And our ultimate vision is to be politically united, where we'll have a complete social, cultural, economic integration with the common foreign and security policies. So that, in a nutshell, is the vision of East Africa and the steps of where we have uh, reached so far. Let's now shift gears and talk about energy. Uh, our region is endowed with various sources of energy spread, out, spread throughout the region. However, most of these are uh, not well developed or not well tapped. As a result, our region is characterized by high dependence on traditional energy sources. It has low access levels and low per capita consumption. Uh, if we look at our countries, uh, our, our average uh, access rate is under 20, varying, uh, with varying levels of access across the uh, countries. Our per capita com uh, uh, consumption is pathetic, and therefore this makes a case for development of energy resources being crucial for stimulating investment, economic growth, and trade. That uh, is a big topic here. The United States, although it's, uh, uh, Kenya is mostly known for geothermal because they have developed geothermal, but all the other partner states also have uh, traces of geothermal. It's just not yet developed. Methane gas in Rwanda, coal in Tanzania and Kenya, Pit in Burundi and Rwanda, uh, wind in all the partner states, and other renewable energy sources such as solar uh, available in all the partner states. So our main issue is translating these resources into energy that can be used for production and uh, for stimulating uh, growth. So that uh, map just shows us roughly uh, where these resources uh, would be located in the region. Potential is high, and yet when you look at what has been uh, developed, is, uh, is quite low. If you look at hydro, for, for example, we have uh, what's, what's uh, estimated is close, close could be more than 8,000. The same case with the uh, geothermal. For hydro, we have hardly 2,000 megawatts uh, installed. For geothermal, which is about 8,000 megawatts uh, potential, and that's what's proven now. It could be more as more and more exploration goes on. Only 593 has been installed, all of it so far in Kenya, but efforts are ongoing to develop uh, geothermal in other partner states. Methane gas has also a high potential for uh, power production. So far we have 25 megawatts in uh, Rwanda. Natural gas is another potential uh, huge energy source in Tanzania, and we have so far about 500 megawatts. But this So in order to develop these resources in a most cost-effective manner for the region, the East African community is uh, pursuing several fronts. First, through policy development, strengthening of national and regional institutions, 
uh, and then developing regional master plans to form a basis for the development of these resources. Then once these regional projects are formulated, then there is a huge task of resource mobilization for that. But also in order to create a thriving regional energy trade, we work with other regional organizations, energy subsector. We have the regional strategy on scaling up access to modern energy services, and each of these uh, bullets could be unpacked to uh, describe more programs and more projects. The region is in the process of establishing a center for renewable energy and energy efficiency that will promote the development of renewable energy and energy efficiency programs throughout the region. This uh, just uh, the other, very recently the Sectoral Council on Energy approved uh, the location for this center. We have programs for small hydro power development. This we realized small hydro is one of the ways for enhancing access. Uh, so, so we have a program for doing that and other programs. The regional strategy itself has four main uh, targets which are aimed at enhancing access in the region. Under the petroleum sector, one of the areas has been uh, joint promotion of the region's potential through our biennial East African Petroleum Conference, which we hold every two years, and uh, we promote the region as an investment destination for petroleum exploration and development. And as a result, we have seen tremendous interest growing for exploration in the region, and uh, some discoveries have uh, been made as a result. But on the other hand, we are also promoting promotion of uh, development of uh, pipeline infrastructure, storage infrastructure, refinery infrastructure uh, for the petroleum sector. On the power sector, we already have in place a regional power master plan, which is a package of generation and transmission projects aimed at uh, interconnecting the region, ensuring the region has sufficient supply, and uh, developing regional power trade. As part of this uh, regional master plan, we have what we call the regional interconnection code, which is a regional equivalent of a national grid code. And this we are working together with the Eastern Africa Power Pool to operationalize it, to make sure that the region is able to interconnect and operate harmoniously. This, uh, uh, with the support of various development partners, the input of Eastern Africa Power Pool, we are trying to close the gap between the capacity of the partner states and the requirements of the grid code so that uh, once the interconnections are in place, then the region can operate seamlessly. So the key interconnection links that uh, region is uh, working on, we have the Ethiopia-Kenya 500 kV or kilovolts high voltage direct current uh, link. Kenya-Uganda transmission line 400 kV. That's under construction. Uh, Ethiopia-Kenya is uh, at uh, EPC stage. Kenya, Tanzania is at uh, procurement of contractor stage. Uganda, Rwanda, 220 volts, uh, kilovolts, and Rwanda, Burundi, those are under construction. In the next, uh, by the end of next year, these lines will be in place. So what do they present to the region? They provide links to, from energy sources anywhere within the region to the demand uh, where the energy will be consumed. Because of the interconnectivity, they'll contribute to long-term energy security, enhance reliability. They'll definitely contribute to uh, access. And they are the roads, they are the link, they are the channels for regional power trade.
Here I want to show you, and I, and I see one of them is not projecting, uh, the, how the capacity and supply is projected to be in the different partners. Unfortunately, the one that's not showing, that's for Burundi, is showing that there is quite a big gap between supply and demand currently and uh, for the next two or so years. However, after that, all the partner states are expected to, to have more supply, more supply than demand. And we've already started seeing this. In Kenya, already there is more than 500 megawatt of uh, spare or extra capacity uh, for Uganda. So in the next few years, we expect the region will be fully uh, able to supply its electricity uh, demand. The challenge is now to maintain this momentum so that power supply is, uh, is, is sustained and so that demand, demand is met and supply does not chase uh, demand as has been the past and the history of this, uh, of this region. In fact, at the moment, if we were interconnected, then the region has sufficient supply. But because we are not interconnected, some countries have shortfall while others have surplus, but there is not much that can be done because the links are not yet complete. Here we see that uh, the generation mix is going to evolve to have geothermal and natural gas play a greater role and uh, thermal generation to reduce uh, its contribution. This is significant in the sense that we'll have more stable, uh, more sustainable sources as the hydro component shrinks, therefore the dependency on uh, weather, the vulnerability to drought is, is, is reduced. It's not eliminated, but is reduced. But in addition to this, there will be uh, the import component and the interconnectivity with other regions will, pro will provide extra uh, security to to the region's energy supply. On the other hand now, let's just talk briefly about the petroleum sector. The region has one existing pipeline from Mombasa, Kenya, to Eldoret in Western Kenya, and Kisumu in Western Kenya. Studies have already been concluded, up to tender documents for extension of this pipeline from Kenya to to Rwanda, and the ESC is, is now launching a study for the Burundi and Kigali, uh, rather the Rwanda-Burundi interconnection of the pipeline. We are also in discussion to develop another pipeline that will link Uganda to Tanzania all the way to Dar es Salaam, what we call Barara, Mwanza, Isaka, Dar es Salaam oil pipeline uh, project. This uh, discussions for initiating the feasibility studies for this are ongoing. So the scenario in future is that the region will be able to access oil products from the international market through the ports and also through the refinery development in Uganda and they will be distributed by oil pipelines and there will be strategic storage uh, points at uh, various locations. In addition, the, oil, the crude oil products from Uganda and Kenya will be a, a pipeline from Alberta and Graben through northern Kenya, where Kenya has oil, and down to Lamu port along the Lapset uh, corridor, where also there will be another refinery in Lamu, but also for there will be provision for export of the crude. These are projects that are in planning stage and studies have been done for 
the crude pipeline, for the Kenya-Uganda-Rwanda pipeline, for the Rwanda-Burundi pipeline, we have just uh, in the procuring stage, uh, we have the funding for that, and we are in discussion with the African Development Bank for the funding of Uganda-Tanzania pipeline link. So, but what are the challenges in the energy sector? One of the big main challenges is that there are long lead times for projects from preparation to implementation. And sometimes in the process of this preparation, uh, demand overtakes supply. That's why I mentioned earlier that we need to sustain the current momentum where supply is a little bit ahead of demand. The other challenge is the uh, issue of attracting private sector investment. Some of the contributing factors are institutional framework, creditworthiness of the power utilities, and the absence of cost reflective tariffs. This is double-edged sword because it is speaking to the regulatory authorities, their independence, and at the same time looking at affordability of the consumer. So the, utility, the regulatory bodies have find themselves in that balancing act. Although regional projects are attractive, they are, the contractual process tends to be rigorous and time consuming. And so they need to start very early before the, the time they are expected to be commissioned. With respect to energy access, as I mentioned, the, our region has very low access levels, and the regional, the, the governments within the region are doing their best to increase this uh, access. However, some of the re reasons why the access is low and the challenges that are faced in enhancing access are settlement patterns, needing long lines for few, uh, for few customers, and affordability of the connection uh, costs. And uh, also that the fact that generation sources are normally very far from the demand centers. However, this also presents some opportunities, some of them being the renewable energy off-grid solutions, solar PV, wind, gas, uh, biogas, small hydro, as I mentioned, efficient biomass, but also innovative business models such as credit facilities, where utilities work with uh, uh, different institutions to provide credit, where utilities connect customers and put it in their bill, spread it over time. Ready boards, where wiring sometimes is a problem for some uh, customers. There are ready boards that are provided with maybe uh, some lighting points and some uh, socket connections, so you, they, they don't need to do wiring. But also support from uh, development partners is contributing to towards uh, enhancing access in the region. We also have, under the ESC, a cross-border electrification program, where the first country to reach a border point electrifies both sides of the border. Uh, so recently we have uh, developed a policy for this. We have been operating on a common understanding, but now we have developed a policy for that, and we have developed a model per supply agreement just to help the transaction. So in conclusion, as I have kept saying several times, we need to sustain the current momentum for investment in the power generation projects and the interconnection, because that is what will link uh, the generation to the, to, the sub, uh, to, the, to the demand. At the same time, interconnecting the networks of the, of the partner states will enable a country, will give a country a chance to develop bigger projects because they know that there will be a market for their, for their energy. However, uh, hand in hand with this, we should continue to 
there is need to reinforce the network to improve reliability of the power supply. Because uh, I'm sure uh, some people will say, oh, you say there is ex excess energy in this country, but they are still experiencing cuts, which may not be related to supply, it may be related to the distribution network and other uh, constraints. So this needs to also uh, be uh, continuously reinforced. Uh, as we approach a time when the region will be fully interconnected, the capacity to implement regional power trade should continue to be enhanced. I thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Peter. That was most illuminating. Now, our third speaker, Miriam Beatty, I think has been sort of unavoidably detained. So what I propose, therefore, is that we go on with the questions for clarification immediately for another five minutes or so before we proceed to coffee. Any questions? Oh, after coffee, the discussants get their moment when we've woken everybody up with coffee. <laughs> Any questions, just for clarification only, because the discussants will be kicking off the, um, the broader discussion on these matters. Yeah. Oh, won't, you, won't you hit your button, please, sir? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to know, do you have a plan for integrated rural energy development for the East African region? We have one in Tanzania. Do you have similar programs for the other East African countries? Do you have a quick answer, Peter? You would? The, the other partner states also have their rural electrification master plans and strategies, but we, we don't have one that's uh, harmonized for the whole region. Okay. Darlington? Yes. Um, in, in relation to um, uh, the point you made in uh, keeping momentum uh, uh, in investment in this area. Um, w one of the, the challenges that have been faced in other regions is that there's this difficulty to, to balance between um, the, 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 the low tariff required by the consumer and the higher tariff required by the investor, uh, so that uh, you end up with uh, power purchase agreements that may not be attractive enough to, uh, to bring in investment. Uh, how are you going around that to attract investment? Thank you. I just would like to ask the scenario of the private and public partnership in the energy sector. Yeah, uh, my sister there is not being asked any question, so I, I want to make sure I ask a question as well. Now, uh, could you make a, a comment, if it's possible, on uh, the services dimensions of uh, uh, regional and global value chains? Because uh, I think my understanding is that uh, actually services make up to make up 40% of manufactured products, so they seem to be an important input into manufacturing. So is there a dimension that we can sensibly talk about in regional value chains from the services perspective? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Just actually follow up on that one. I think um, uh, a number of the countries within the East African region and of course also the other African countries uh, now being blessed, if you want to call it, with the, uh, the petroleum-related uh, extractive industry. And uh, it will be interesting, of course, to see how that fits within the value chain and uh, integrating the chains uh, arrangement. For example, looking at the upstream, uh, the downstream, and then the different linkages uh, within the horizontal uh, setup and how regional integration then fits into that picture. So if that perspective could be elaborated, that would be nice. Maybe Cornelia, you want to uh, give that package of questions a go quickly? There you are. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think as has, has come up in several presentations or discussions, I mean, services are a very integral part of trade and specifically of, 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 of value chains. And um, so this, this may be earlier traditional view of like manufacturing sector, service, agriculture, I mean, is, is not, um, I mean, probably never has been that separate, but now it's very much interlinked. And also with regard to um, seeing like who does which steps, we see that in, in several value chains, the higher value added activities involve certain service activities and not really the, the, the manufacturing production. I mean, for sure manufacturing, there are very different I mean, types of manufacturing, but still very many of these high value added components have at least a service, service component. Eh? Um, so I think they, yeah, they are, they are very important for, for, for every value chain and specifically for trade. I mean, you have all these logistics, I mean, finance, I mean, all these issues that, 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 that come in. Um, and it, it's similar with energy. I mean, it's, it's interesting with this. I mean, energy is, and we can also comment, I mean, it's a value chain in itself on the one side. Um, like many products, you can look uh, from a value chain perspective and it's often quite, quite useful. Um, and you have certain lead firms and supplier and certain outsourcing dynamics and which is quite, um, has been very important dynamics in, in, in the energy sector um, recently. Um, but on the other side, for sure, energy is an important supply to, 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 all other, um, to all other aspects. And I mean, specifically when I talked about the apparel sector quite, um, 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 quite a lot, I mean, and I think to have a textile sector in the region is important. Not every country can have it, but it, I mean, and there are some countries that have, but for the export oriented industry, I think it's very important to link it to a textile sector and either to the cotton sector. And there are clearly electricity and cost and reliability is really important because it's a very energy intensive, more capital intensive sector compared to, to garment and, and apparel. And this is just one manufacturing sector and in many others um, um, we see even, even stronger constraints. So it's also very important as, a, as an input for, for different activities, clearly. Thank you, Cornelia. Peter, did you want to? Oh, you got one there, right? Uh, thank you. Um, with regard to the issue of uh, momentum <coughs> and the challenge for, on one hand, low tariffs for end users and sufficient tariffs for the IPPs, the independent power producers, one of the important things is to, to have a, a predictable uh, tariff uh, adjustment uh, policy at or strategy such that uh, when 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 uh, an IPP signs an IPPA, they know exactly what they will be uh, getting into. Uh, on the other hand, the all the partner states are working towards uh, raising their tariffs to cost-reflective uh, levels. Because of course each IPP that comes in, they will look at uh, the books of the power utilities, uh, the tariff, can the tariff sustain what they are uh, trying to, to get in. But uh, the regulators of course don't want to shock the system with big jumps. Uh, some, some partner states have uh, almost gotten there where the tariffs are uh, cost reflective or almost cost reflective. The others are going through it, going through it in stages. Uh, but the, the, the other side of it is that uh, with a clear least cost uh, per development plan, then you can engage, you can initiate the procurement process for the IPPs early with a target date of when their power plant is supposed to be in place so that you don't strand the, the asset, but you conclude all the negotiations and the PPA that would normally take a, a long time to, to conclude. So if you know uh, and you have your projections of demand that a certain year will need this plant, then you start the procurement process early enough to give room for the flexibility and the intricate nature of the uh, transactions. The PPA, PPP scenario in the region, uh, now most of the countries have a PPA policy and in cases, some cases PPA Act that governs the 
public-private sector, uh, public-private uh, partnerships, uh, not only in the power sector, but in uh, other sectors as well. Uh, for, for a fact, the procurement of uh, independent power producers in the region involves uh, uh, not only the utility that is concerned, but also the government uh, plays a big role because of its uh, uh, commitment to supply sufficient energy to the region. And it's a big player in, in the transactions that uh, uh, it has a say in the transactions that take place. And in some cases, some, uh, power, some independent power producers require some uh, uh, letters of comfort or uh, sometimes some guarantees uh, from the government. Now to the value chain in the petroleum uh, sector. This sector has indeed uh, opened up opportunities for different kinds of uh, businesses and uh, value chain processes because the exploration process itself involves many sectors across the board. And what the partner states are doing is to uh, very carefully craft local content uh, uh, policies and laws which, to which we have uh, made contributions as, as a region. We exchange, uh, uh, we have forum where we exchange uh, information on this. And uh, this uh, local content uh, contributes to establishment of various farms, some of them are clearing and forwarding, some of them are uh, handling uh, 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 hospitality, uh, environment, uh, both service and uh, technical input. So, so many local uh, organizations have found a niche, have found a place to, to play in, in, the, in, in this uh, uh, petroleum sector. So there is, a, there is room for a value chain of uh, local participation uh, through what uh, the local industry can contribute. And over time, uh, the local economies will contribute even more sophisticated uh, inputs to the petroleum uh, sector. Wanted to add yeah, I just want to add, I think that there's huge potential not only to increase value-added and local or regional content in, in, in the sector, but also to build um, capacities that can be then used for other sectors. For example, I think in some um, 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 power sectors, I mean, um, IT service providers were developed that now also provide services to several other industries. So it's also a possibility to start certain support industries, specifically in the service area, that then are also very useful for other, for other sectors. I just have a question. You talked about the role, uh, the potential role for off-grid suppliers as well. How significant do you think this potentially could be? Are you talking about sort of 1% of total capacity or more? And um, a corollary question is, these off-grid suppliers, some of the, the reading that I've done about off-grid supply in other parts of the world seems to indicate that they can frequently come in at a lower cost, not being such enormous investment projects and that can maybe help in some areas to bridge the gap between effectively what consumers can pay and what investors need. Is this so or is this not? And to what degree do you see this as part of the solution? In, indeed, the off-grid off, off -grid solutions, the the, the issue with uh, one of the things with off-grid solutions is that uh, the regulatory framework allows low capacities, uh, say below a one megawatt, to enter the market with less stringent requirements than other other players. That's 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 one thing. Uh, and then, in 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 most cases, they are they are organised around uh, a demand centre where they can be vertically integrated. Maybe it's a small hydro project uh, distributing uh, electricity to, to a village or to a small community. And the people in that area are involved in 
in, in, in working on the project and also in developing the project. And, and generally the, the cost would be lower. The other aspect is that uh, e governments have uh, incentives for, for renewable energy uh, components such as uh, solar PVs and their related, uh, related uh, accessories that enable then these soft grid solutions to take place. Well, that, thank you very much. That answers the question. Um, shall we take a brief coffee break now and perhaps reconvene at uh, quarter to four here so that we can launch into the discussion phase of the afternoon? Thank you.
Colleagues, uh, shall we settle down so that we can resume our deliberations? Shall we settle down? Uh, the two discussants are Martin Kiden, is that correct? Kidan, <laughs> uh, from Anctad, and uh, uh, Hosiena Lunongelo. Um, I will then uh, call on uh, Martin to um, comment on the, uh, on the presentations, and then Hosiena will, will, will take over. Your floor. You, you have some slides? Yeah, so you. Thank you. Um, I'll just begin maybe by briefly introducing myself. My name is Martine Jules saint kidan and I'm uh, with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development with the Trade Division. Um, I would also like to say thank you to uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me to this event. I have to say it's always quite nice for me to participate in ICTSD events because when a uh, number of years back I started to, to become interested in trade issues, I actually started out with an internship at the ICTSD. So this uh, sort of brings me back to my first days in trade. Um, actually, I was asked to um, make some comments more specifically on the topic of structural transformation through services. Unfortunately, we have not had the presentation this afternoon. And I have to say, um, I was actually expecting, I was hoping to get the paper in advance. Um, in an absence of that, I was hoping to at least to be able to react to the presentation. Um, but I have prepared a few um, PowerPoint slides. I hope, yes, we can get them up. Um, what I have done is um, I just um, tried to um, draw out some of the main findings from two recent um, UNCTAD publications that I believe should be of interest to you because they touch directly upon this issue of uh, economic and structural um, transformation. So actually I brought um, copies of the uh, most recent of the two documents. They are at the back um, table there. And so um, the first study that uh, I will be uh, referring to is actually um, the report of last year from our um, LDC um, country report of 2014, which focused specifically on growth with structural transformation and was looking particularly at issues relating to the post-2015 um, development agenda. So basically trying to identify um, the leakages with things such as economic and social development, poverty reduction, and structural transformation. So what are some of the main findings of this study that I think would be a particular interest to the region given um, that you do have uh, several LDCs in the group. So first of all, since we're looking at the uh, sector of services, the fastest employment growth in the LDCs occurred in the services sector, 
where it exceeded 3% per year, and the per period that we're looking to is between 1991 and 2012. And the reason why we're looking at um, this growth um, between the different sectors is that um, when we look at structural transformation, I'm sure you will have discussed um, the definition early on this morning. Basically, we're looking at the reallocation of resources from uh, economic activities uh, that are that have a lower productivity to higher productivity. And in that context, we look at um, what are the shifts between the services sector and other sectors. So actually, within the LDCs, in terms of employment, the services sector is where we have been seeing the most growth. growth. While the services sector led the transformation of sectoral shares of employment in LDCs, its share of output remained vir virtually unchanged. So that um, is the other um, factor that we look at. We look at um, what is happening in terms of employment, but also in terms of the output uh, of the different sectors. And unfortunately, the trend has been in the services sectors of LDCs that this um, output has not grown in the same period where we have seen the growth in employment. So therefore, um, the conclusion that we draw from this is that the labor productivity expansion in the services sector has been very modest or even has regressed. And so um, what this study and actually the second study that I'll uh, present to you suggests is that when we look at the role of services within structural transformation, um, while there may be a positive aspect in, the, in terms of the growing importance of the services sector, we need to be careful because um, actually the shift to services may be actually shift to low value services and this will have an impact in terms of um, poverty reduction. So labor productivity and services did not show strong growth in LDCs during that uh, period. Employment and services grew rapidly, partly as a result of rural and urban migration. Urban industry is not able to absorb um, most rural migrants, so they are obliged to resort to low productivity informal services sectors, what we um, have termed in the report refuge activities. So again, in terms of the policy discussions that we will be having later on, one of the interesting points will be to see what services are we talking about? Because already, I'm sure earlier this morning and um, earlier this afternoon in the presentations, um, different categories of ser services were mentioned. When we talk about value chains, we can talk about infrastructure services, we can talk about um, mid-level services, in terms of um, value addition, very high value uh, services, um, but also because we're talking about services activities, um, we have those categories of services that contribute to social development like education and health. And so always within the discussions on um, these issues of structural transformation, we must look at exactly what categories of services we're talking about because this will have an impact not only on growth, employment, but then eventually on poverty reduction. And then finally, since low product Productivity is associated with low incomes. Low productivity jobs and services not only restrain a dynamic structural transformation, but also keeps workers in poverty. So again, um, that we do see uh, structural transformation, but th this structural transformation can be more or less positive depending on the specific um, conditions in each country. So I would have been particularly interested to see in the study that was done um, by um, the, the Ms. Uh, Mbiti from the University of Nairobi, I believe focusing on Kenya, but we can also discuss with the participants on your own countries, what has been um, the trend in um, your own economy? Um, where has the shift to services gone and what type of services sectors have we seen the shift in terms of employment specifically? Now the second study that I would like to refer to is a study, a report that came out this year. Um, and actually this is one that is um, in the back. I brought some copies in the back. So it's our um, Economic Development in Africa report of this year. Basically um, it focuses on unlocking the potential of Africa's services trade for growth and development. And one of the important focus of the report is on this notion of structural transformation. There's other aspects which may be relevant and that we can come back to, including um, the issue of uh, trade policy and um, whether there's a disconnect between trade policy making at national, regional, and hopefully continental ne uh, level when this kicks in at the AU level. But as I said, structural transformation is a very important um, focus of the paper, including because um, one of the starting points uh, that we always begin with when we discuss development in Africa is again to highlight the importance of the services sector, um, notably in terms of uh, uh, output. 
um, and uh, employment in certain cases. So as the dominant sector in many African economies today, services need to support the process of structural transformation. The continent will need to shift away from relying on subsist subsistence and non-tradable services to services which generate greater value addition and growth. And there was an interesting question that was raised in relation again to the value chains about what type of services are we seeing in these value chains. And as I said earlier, generally um, needing to fine tune and characterize exactly what services we're talking about because there's some services such as transport or uh, retail where um, uh, basically productivity can be quite low or value addition and then we can have some let's say mid-level uh, services uh, for some uh, examples such as certain categories of professional services and then f let's uh, say for example financial services um, at the top in terms of uh, value addition. So basically this report again highlights as the previous one that um, we do need to have a, a shift towards services which generate greater value addition. Africa is a marginal player in global services imports and in exports. So Africa represents rep uh, respectively 4% and 2.2% of world total imports and exports of services. However, and I think this is an important point that is made because I have also found that it's an element that comes always comes back in our discussions at the national level. Um, in the context of my work, I have been engaged um, with several countries um, in the region and in the SADC region um, on services policy reviews and assessments of the services sector. And often we have this discussion with um, policymakers on the importance of exports and imports. And often there's um, an, uh, uh, um, the starting point often is that uh, basically, the policymakers are looking to see how to increase exports in terms of their trade strategy and how to reduce import. But this report highlights that that is not necessarily a negative thing to have a high level of um, imports because that can actually reflect a growing growth and demand for services imports and uh, quickly growing productive sectors. Earlier, we mentioned um, the growing importance of different services activities within industrial activities, even within agricultural activities, also within um, uh, extractive industries and so if the country is um, importing services to feed into these um, industries and upgrade um, these industries then that can actually uh, in the end be a beneficial thing for the country. Uh, similarly, a low-level export may suggest that more domestic services are being used to relieve supply bottlenecks in the domestic economy. So again, this is not necessarily a negative thing uh, to see that um, imports are actually higher than the level of exports. So basically, the report concludes that many African countries have undergone a shift from agriculture to mainly non-tradable services without going through a process of manufacturing development. So um, in previous discussions on structural transformation, often it was thought that the shift was from agriculture both towards manufacturing and eventually to services. But actually, this report suggests that in the case of certain African economies, the shift has been mainly towards services. However, these lower value non-tradable services. And um, so the, the fact that maybe there's this gap or this missing link with uh, manufacturing development um, can have negative implications for things such as productivity improvements, formal job creation, um, export of sophisticated goods, and the application of technology to the wider economy. Because we know that in the manufacturing sector, um, sometimes we do see um, these developments. And so basically the report concludes by saying that complementarities between the two sectors, uh, manufacturing and services, but also with the other sectors as I indicated, um, will have to be more fully developed in some of the countries in the region. And so basically those were um, the main findings. I, as I said earlier, I was hoping to draw some links with um, the paper by uh, Ms. Mbiti, but um, in the absence of that, I just wanted to um, suggest maybe some of the topics that we can have for the discussion here. So within the services sectors, what policies could encourage a shift from low value to higher value services within um, your economies? What policy measures could support formalization of informal service suppliers um, and thereby leading to the enhancement of their productivity? 
what linkages can be promoted between the services sector and high productivity industrial activities. And then finally, since a large proportion of the workforce may remain in the agricultural sector, as we've seen is the case um, in many countries of the region today, how can services be used to increase the productivity um, of the agricultural sector, thereby um, contributing to poverty reductions? So those were just some of the guiding questions that I um, uh, wanted to raise. And then finally, um, also maybe um, within the discussion, um, I personally would be interested because that's a focus of my work um, on any elements that um, the participants may want to provide in terms of not only the content of the policies um, that may be relevant, but also some of the processes. Because um, I work more specifically on uh, services sector policies, including the trade-related uh, policies relating to the services sector, and we have seen that just policy making within the service sector is a challenge in itself. And here we're looking at uh, policy making at even a broader level, where we're looking basically at the broader industrial and development um, policies, and how do we ensure that we have um, the coherence between the different sectors, between the different areas of uh, policy making that were mentioned earlier, investment, trade, industrial policy, et cetera. So if you have any insights on the processes in addition to um, the content, I would be interested in, in hearing that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that presentation. Uh, round of applause. I, I, I would want uh, the participants to, to capture these uh, issues that have been raised uh, in, in form of questions. Uh, we'll, we'll come to them uh, when doing the, the wrap up so that we can have uh, a, a more broad uh, discussion and interactive um, uh, you know, conversation on these issues. Uh, I now uh, invite uh, the second uh, uh, discussant, uh, Osena Lonogelo. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, not because I am a former ambassador, <laughs> but simply because I think I've used, if you're a discussant, if you prepare yeah. PowerPoint, then you become like another presentation. Actually, it once happened to me, I prepared the PowerPoint, and then people said, it's like you are the main presenter now, because you get carried away. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking ICT SD and the University of Nairobi uh, for organizing this workshop uh, to, de to, de to, de to deliberate on advancing East Africa's development priorities through trade, uh, trying to make sense out of multiple trade integration opportunities. I was specifically uh, requested to comment as a discussant on the theme of advancing East Africa's trade and sustainable development objectives, which was specifically picked to remind us that trade is among, should actually, be an, an important instrument in realizing inclusive growth as defined in the UN, UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals 2030. Among the strategies for achieving inclusive growth is to promote regional or value chain as ably presented by uh, Dr. Uh, Cornelia uh, Staritz, uh, so that uh, most of the functions uh, with the attendant uh, vertical and the or 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 horizontal linkages before the final product is ready for consumption are undertaken within East Africa. I think that's the spirit. Uh, Cornelia has demonstrated the immense benefits uh, in terms of jobs uh, creation and income distribution among various actors along the value chains. It is also recognized that uh, for regional value chains to prosper, there's an urgent need to scale, scale up the supply and of course smooth access uh, of electricity. As explained by engineer P Peter Kinuthia, the implementation of East Africa's uh, power master plan, which is linked to the South Africa power pool, is key to trading of value added uh, products uh, instead of raw materials. And, and thus, uh, uh, trading of value-added products is important because it, it has the potential to increase job opportunities and, of, of course, uh, household incomes. As he rightly noted, it is hoped that additional supply of electricity is expected into the regional power pool, power pool once natural gas uh, wells are in full production in Tanzania. And, of course, he did not say, but uh, I know that uh, the Renaissance hydroelectricity dam in Ethiopia, once commissioned, will also add significantly to uh, the sources of power for the region. We know, of course, that the Inga Dam in DRC 
is one of the well uh, widely talked uh, project, but it's, it's a long way uh, before it is a commission or Africa can benefit from it. Uh, but uh, Peter, when you are presenting, I, I noted that uh, you, you, you skipped uh, in, in the map that connectivity from Zambia uh, through Tunduma going to the, 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 we call power, 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 power electricity uh, five in Tanzania funded by ATP. And that project is meant really to, to, to link Tanzania with the Southern Purple and then uh, uh, link to Kenya. That's the, co the contract you are talking that Kenya is in the process of um, getting some contractors for that. So in Tanzania, we are already ahead in doing that. Um, I, I, st I, I stress on the importance of electricity uh, simply because among the lessons uh, from Tanzania's extractive industry is the loss of jobs and local linkages uh, when minerals, and that's the experience in Tanzania, are extracted and exported in raw forms. In the agricultural sector, for example, uh, more than 70% of our commodities are exported uh, and processed. Consequently, our people have failed to comprehend uh, when us economists tell them that the economy has, has been growing at an average of 7% for the past 10 years, because they don't see that growth translating to improvements in household income. The levels of poverty, for example, in, in most of the East African countries, maybe for, for, let's just let, take the example of Tanzania. For, 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 t for almost 10 years, uh, it, it, it was reduced only for si by 6 percent points, from 34 uh, percent people living uh, below poverty in 2011 uh, to 28 percent as we, we, we speak, which is considered too low for a country boasting or for countries boasting of ample land for agriculture, minerals like gold, diamond, Tanzanite for Tanzania, and of course recently natural gas, iron ore, coal, and uranium. Uh, so in order to address that weakness, uh, t t Tanzania decided deliberately that uh, the initial production of natural gas will have to be converted uh, into electricity uh, before we, 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 supply, we, we, we meet the uh, the electricity demand uh, for, for, for the country and, of course, for the, the region. The idea that we are going to export uh, to, to other uh, ESC uh, and SADC countries. Of course, I have some questions for Peter later for discussion. ESC governments also recognize that given the, that the majority uh, of these people depend on land uh, as farmers and livestock keepers, uh, it, 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 it knows that there's need to improve crop and livestock productivity and also create an East African market for such commodities so as to optimize the synergies of diverse agroecological potentials. Uh, the African Union Comprehensive Agri uh, African Agriculture Development Program, CADEP, is a blueprint for Africa's green revolution. Uh, and, and Tanzania, with the initial support from OECD uh, countries, initiated the SACOT, Southern African uh, 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 South, uh, South, uh, Southern uh, uh, Agriculture Growth Corridor of Tanzania, uh, which is based on the principle of mutual benefits between uh, local farmers and multinational companies, so that uh, uh, the, the companies can provide it, uh, uh, technology, uh, capital, and also assurance of markets, which we are talking about inclusive growth as part of their trade. But we know that uh, the multinationals have access to international uh, markets. Uh, and therefore, uh, Tanzania decided uh, deliberately to change the way uh, multinationals engage uh, in, in our country. So the approach uses what they call contract farming with the government of Tanzania ensuring public goods such as electricity and rural roads uh, so, so, so that uh, um, uh, productivity can, 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 there will be no constraint on how to, 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 to bring in inputs but also or to, to take out uh, uh, the products, uh, process them, and then export to, to, to other countries. Uh, it, it's, it's a, the, the approach uses, uh, okay, I think, it, it's an approach avoiding the creation of, of what, we, what development economists call export encla enclaves, when, which, which happen in Asia, when the peasants are replaced from their land by, by, by multinationals engaged in agriculture. And I think one of the criticisms, for example, if the approach by uh, the approach which Ethiopia had taken to bring to invite Indian investors, uh, and they, they are engaged now in uh, taking large, uh, a big chunk of land uh, for producing uh, horticulture, uh, floriculture. I think one of the uh, the criticism is that uh, that you you take that land, but then does it really bring some benefits to the local population? Yeah. Um, 
let's also re uh, let's also remember that the ESC uh, member states have, in principle, agreed to encourage regional trade uh, of food products, so that traders can easily take food commodities from surplus uh, to deficit areas within the region. I think the concept which the, the, the parliamentary committee for the East African uh, Assembly was that we want a, 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 a trade-driven food, food security system. I think it came after uh, that famine uh, five years ago. I think that's when the EAC parliamentarians decided that can't really, it's a shame. We, we know that within the five East African countries, if we really came with a good strategy, uh, trade uh, can, uh, can, can uh, uh, or traders can ration. If governments can't, because governments have, are there to provide free food. But then if you put the right environment um, in terms of the investment opportunity, climate, but also the trading uh, climate, then traders can actually do that rationing. And, and by then, I think one of the examples they are using was that Uganda, M7 had, for 10 years actually, ahead of time, was using that approach. Although it's not, there's no policy for that, uh, that he realized that if, even when you, 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 you prevent traders from taking food to a, to a neighboring country, they will still do it. And, and of course, you just increase the final consumer price because they will have to bribe uh, the police as they, they cross uh, roadblocks and the border points. Uh, so, so, so for learning from that one, and I was part of that team, we made it now to convince ourselves that the EEC as, me, as member says they should adopt that approach. Uh, so, 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 so we, we know that among the initiatives which EEC is undertaking is also to work with the, uh, the, the East African uh, grain uh, producers to, to establish a, a commodity exchange uh, like the one in Ethiopia. Uh, which will also uh, help to, to make sure that we, we have enough stocks uh, for, 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 for trading uh, in, terms of the, in terms of crop failure uh, within the region, but also for exporting. The, the finalization of regional, regionally harmonized sanitary and financial standards is, of course, a very instrumental to the realization of this goal of free movement, on, especially of unprocessed agricultural communities, because of the, the fear of spreading uh, diseases and, 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 and Yes. Uh, there is also a success in reciprocal recognition of approved standards. Most of the products now, um, if they are uh, packed, packaged in, in Kenya with a, a stamp of Kenya Bureau of, Sta uh, of Standards, they, they are easily now, or even if in Uganda you have the Uganda Bureau of Standards or Tanzania, so there, there is a reciprocal recognition of approved standards. So, so that's, a, that's another uh, success in terms of uh, enhancing uh, uh, trade uh, am, am among the regions. As, as noted in the previous uh, session in the morning, I think, uh, Tanzania is second after Uganda as a net exporter of food commodities to the EAC member states, most of which are unprocessed, of course. But as we know, intra-African trade on the finished products depends largely on the availability of electricity. I think, I think that's why my, my, colleagues, my colleague from the Chamber of Commerce in Ethiopia was, was alluding to in the morning. And if, if we, ca we shouldn't blame ourselves that we are not trading, because we are also producing the, the same. If we are, we are producing maize, you're producing maize. We can now compete if we package it in different uh, uh, brands, or even flour. You can have different brands of flour, uh, for, for example, there's a brand of flour I like here. When I come here, I buy. And yet in, in, in Tanzania, we have, we have maize. Because, but the, the test and the way you process will be different. Uh, but as, 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 a, as a failure of, of countries like Tanzania, uh, of course, Uganda was clever. They brought some Pakistanis uh, to, to fulfill our Goa 1 export quota. was largely uh, caused by lack of adequate electricity. Uh, so, so when we talk about East, East African governments, including Tanzania, coming with the rural supply, uh, electricity supply, uh, it's, it's, it's about really trying to spur uh, growth of our processing facilities, uh, which will hopefully create a form of rural-based jobs and ex ex exported value-added products uh, that, of course, generating uh, more income. Now, one of the pending constraints for, of, for in, in encouraging industrial production and trade is lack of development capital or within uh, development finance within the, within the region, and and of course uh, and Tanzania is even more serious because we don't we don't have really a well capitalized development bank. Uh, we we have been talking about, for example, starting an agricultural bank uh, started uh, registered the last year, but with a very meager uh, capital, not uh, not worth even mentioning. 
Um, so so that's, I, I think, in terms of financing, that's still a, a pending issue in terms of resource mobilization uh, for, to, to encourage uh, that, that type of uh, industries as, as a sure way uh, of, of ensuring uh, uh, inclusive growth in, in, in the region. And as uh, Cornelia noted, foreign-owned firms established in the ESC are not necessarily interested in fostering inclu inclusive growth, growth per, per se. And th that's actually an, a point which was also, is, is also raised in the UNECA's 2013 report, which stressed the need to empower local industrialists and traders by availing them with adequate uh, capital. We will also agree that the uh, key, the key to, for promoting intra-regional trade will be uh, scaling up energy supply, parallel to improvements in regional uh, infrastructure project, transport protection in infrastructure projects, so as to simplify movement of man manufactured goods and people. Talking about people and the critical nature of services that come with the trade, it is also important for the ESC partner states to harmonize their educational and skills development approaches to allow, so as to allow uh, for seamless exchange of experts. Among the services that must assume a regional dim dimension uh, include mutual recognition of certification of goods, as I just said, uh, issued by partner states, transfer, transferability of pension contributions by workers, uh, and of course regional coverage of insurance, among, among others. So that, that's key. If we, we need really to, to have uh, promote trade within the region. And, uh, the, the, and the fin finally, and these are like questions we started uh, discussing during tea time, uh, and I, had, I, want to, I want to pose to all of you, uh, is that if, we, if what we heard uh, Engineer Kinudia saying, that it's like Kenya and Uganda already end entering into a, a, a surplus phase, and yet we know Tanzania is still in, has huge plans for uh, generating additional electricity. Uh, Ethiopia with their uh, reconnaissance, uh, renaissance dam, are also uh, in, in maybe in four years to come, they will also having uh, the, the enough power to, 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 to export to the region. Uh, what is the implication of that uh, assumption that uh, we, 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 we need to have uh, supply-led uh, excess uh, supply of electricity uh, and what will it mean actually for, for private uh, investors? Because we know that one of the approaches which we use in e East Africa uh, is to encourage what they call public-private partnership, uh, encouraging uh, private operators also to, to invest in, in, power, in power generation. Now, if uh, uh, state uh, utility companies uh, succeed in, in generating uh, surplus power, so what will mean now to the investment by the, the private sector? I think those, those are the questions. Um, and, and I want also to, 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 to ask uh, that maybe that's a specific if, to Engineer Kinude, if you know. Do you know that Tanzania's private sector operators had actually completed a feasibility study, including sourcing or financing, like 15 years ago? for a, a pipeline project from uh, Dar es Salaam to Mwanza to, up to Uganda. I wanted to know whether you are aware so that if you're not aware, we can exchange information later on. Because I can see like you are talking about starting afresh, it's like something which has never been done. And um, uh, seven was really uh, encouraging the Tanzania private sector then, because they, they wanted to have an alternative route for oil um, uh, transportation through pipeline. Uh, my institution, ESF, did, did the initial feasibility, uh, the, the, the regional center for mapping here, the one which actually did the, the surveying and the mapping, and then they even sourced, found some investors from U.S. Uh, for that. And then it uh, slowly, I think, didn't get, after, after, but it was almost ready. Uh, uh, there, there are some uh, political economy issues which I think might have prevented it from taking off. So uh, maybe you might want to, to follow from, from there. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, we know that uh, as part of the, uh, the discovery of, of natural gas, uh, there was some initial discussion between Tanzania and, and, and Kenya to have a pipeline for transporting uh, natural gas from Tanzania to, to Mombasa coast, along the coastline. So I wanted to know whether that is still in, in your plans or it, 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 get, it, it fell through the, uh, the fingers. Um, my other fear is, is that uh, which you talked about, uh, the, 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 the local content policy which uh, uh, East African uh, uh, partner states are developing. That's the, my final point. And, and, and my fear is that Tanzania is already ahead of the game. Um, and and uh, one of the assumptions which I fear is that uh, 
when we talk about local content, if you read through our, our Tanzanian local content policy, actually uh, Kenyans are not part of the local, or Ugandans are not part of the local definition. And yet we are talking about East Africans and we have uh, the East African uh, master power plan. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> so, so I think those are the, uh, uh, the, my, my fears. And, and finally, finally, the last point. I, I think uh, I, I we see also, well, we have not talked much, the role of ICT in enhancing regional trade. I think that's an, 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 an area which uh, we, we met uh, last year, 2014, January in Mombasa, uh, whereby we, as part of, 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 of having uh, some hubs uh, for supply of commodities within the region, uh, ICT uh, linked uh, regional markets uh, for commodities, for cereals, would, 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 would have been one of those approaches. And I think that's, that's an area, again, engineer you might want to, to, to pursue, at least, or the EAC might want to pursue. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that commentary. Um, ordinary, ordinarily, I'll be um, saying that uh, I, I give uh, a summary of, of uh, our discussions uh, today. But I think that uh, it, is, it is more helpful for us to interact. Uh, and I think that uh, you, you may have questions about um, you know, any topic of the day or specific to this uh, particular panel. Uh, now is the time to raise it, and then we can have a round of discussions, uh, um, an interactive discussion. So please uh, feel free to raise issues or questions that you may have uh, on these broad issues that we have discussed uh, today. The floor is open. Yes. Um, Cornelia, I just wanted to ask you, um, you've spoken a little bit about the differences in a vertically specialized versus a regionally additive value chain and some of the policy choices that go with that. Is that a, a either and or um, is it for a government policy to have to focus on either choosing a winning value chain or um, are these complementary policies? And then um, in terms of the SMME sector, do you have to have different poli a set of po policy tools to get the SMMC sector involved? And do they necessarily have to link into um, existing value chains, or is there potential for them to develop their own? Yeah, in order for this discussion to be interactive, I'll, I'll uh, have a question answered immediately. It's, uh, it's raised. So, uh, Cornelia, you can respond. Um. I mean, the first question, I mean, that's, that's more complementary. And I think it's also um, because different value chains have certain characteristics related to the type of product. And that's somehow why you can differentiate these broad families. But then, as I also said later, I mean, even within these broad products, I mean, different end markets, different lead firms, different types of um, products in the same product category have different dynamics. And I think it's important to, to, to understand these dynamics also for policy, to see um, where does it make, uh, which policy makes sense, which can be more um, developmental, which, which less. So I think it's important to understand these dynamics. But I think it's, it's more complementary. And I also think it's not, I mean, we always have debates um, because um, for these resource-based, for sure the, the big question is value addition, forward, backward um, linkages. But I think eventually, also for the vertically specialized, even so you can enter in a certain specialized um, um, activity. I mean, the question then is how can you increase your value added? Um, and that means changing the activities you do, but also broadening the activities. And I think specifically for Sub-Saharan Africa, on a regional case, that, that's important. And this also involves certain linkages. And so, so several manufacturing activities also link to, to commodities, to processing. So I think it's not always also so easy to differentiate. Yeah? But it's still important to understand this value chain, chain, value chain um, um, dynamics. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, this is what, what the point I only said very quickly at the end. I mean, when we talk about we need product, productive capacity, I mean, the question of which entrepreneurs and which enterprises exist or don't exist is, is quite a, a crucial one. Yeah? And I think that the missing SME sectors, I mean, the, or the missing 
more formal, smaller and medium sized um, firms um, or firms that, that can grow is, 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 a, is, a, huge, is a huge issue. Um, and the point I also wanted to make, and I think there should have been a presentation, but it's also the, the question of financing, because financing is not everything. Yeah? But I see that it is crucial and there, I would say, is a, was somehow, there's somehow a missing middle. Because there has been, and now there's more critique about it, but this huge um, increase in microfinance, yeah, which can be important, but it also um, finances informal small activities, which many of them have no chance to become productive or, or to, to increase. Yeah? So it cannot be the, the only way. Yeah? And then there have been large investment attraction projects, often in EPZs, that often, because of the size, they focused on foreign direct investment. Yeah? But some uh, long-term, quite relatively cheap, productive financing for SMEs is really missing, um, totally. And I mean, I mean, and then for sure it's about skills, workers, management, and more issues. And, and, and both, I mean, I think there, there are value chains, some you, you could link to, um, but it's also about creating maybe, maybe new, new value chains. Yeah? I mean, it's not, it really depends on the sector and on the, on the circumstances. Thank you. Um, question there, then I'll come to you. Thank you. My question goes to Martin Kidan. Uh, uh, in her presentation, she was talking about uh, we Africans have, I think, uh, to say it, transformed or skipped from agriculture to add directly to non tradable uh, services. Uh, does that mean we have skipped some uh, maybe evolution process, I could say? Uh, and what's the implication of that? And does it have anything to do with uh, current situation in Africa? Martin? Yes. Um, so as I indicated earlier, um, I was basically presenting the fine needs of this report. And I have to say, this is not um, the area of my, uh, the focus of my work uh, personally, but this is prepared um, by another team in UNCTAD. Um, often we hear about um, countries using strategies um, with the services sector to somehow, somehow leapfrog certain stages of development. And um, apparently, according to the findings of the study, certain countries have indeed um, uh, shifted uh, quite extensively to certain services sectors. And they have identified that um, uh, in some cases that given the low productivity and um, the nature of uh, certain of these sectors, then it would be good um, not to forget the emphasis on still nonetheless developing the manufacturing sector. But also, I think, um, my takeaway from this report, and again, this is what I was uh, referring to in terms of the, complexi the complexity of it all, is that they also say that depending on the specificity of the economy um, that we're um, uh, dealing with uh, specifically, you do need still to uh, link the services, whether to the agricultural sector or to some extractive industries. And so I think that um, maybe we're moving away from um, suggestions that we can leapfrog or we can ignore uh, specific sectors, even the agricultural sectors, because um, there, there has been a, a maybe a very um, quick um, description of economists that say that as um, economies develop, we move from uh, agriculture commodities and move more and more towards manufacturing and eventually towards services. And there is this long-term trend. However, um, as I said, there was also in certain interests the, the idea of leapfrogging. But I think what this report goes back to is saying that no, we do need to look at each economy specifically, um, look at the endowments in that economy, and nonetheless work to develop um, with um, the actual resources of the economy, whether it could be agriculture or um, other uh, resources, also because of the impacts in terms of poverty reduction. So in the case of um, agriculture, because of, of the link to employment still, we can't just say, okay, let's move away and move into manufacturing or only services, because we do see that um, uh, agriculture does remain a large employer. 
So for me, that actually points to maybe the complexity of these um, industrial or broader development policies that we're talking about. And if I may, just again, just hearing Cornelia um, refer to all the different elements um, that um, uh, are important in terms of developing these GVCs, sometimes we wonder, um, can we identify maybe some priority areas? Because if I were a government official and um, I'm told that I have to be careful about uh, the financing issues, the uh, promotion of the uh, SMEs, issues such as education, innovation, all these issues, trade policies that all have to be um, uh, carefully crafted and developed in order to really benefit from um, uh, whether these value chains or these trade opportunities. Um, it's uh, quite difficult to see how do we actually go about in terms of prioritizing and actually developing a, a plan to do all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cornelia, you wanted to have a comeback to yeah, I can I come back to the question, but first I just wanted to support what you said. I mean, I think um, yeah, services are very um, diverse, and um, with regard to productivity, and and I think the most of the high um, productivity or high value added services they are directly linked to manufacturing. So I would totally agree that this service based development strategy is very questionable. Um, and what you, for example, what India is the case, which is always named. I mean, these services are very much link linked to industrial and, and manufacturing activities. So it's not isolated, but it's linked to, to manufacturing um, um, very often. But still, services are uh, crucial, even some, some of, the, of the low value added access. To, and, even like within transport or retail, it's not just low value added. I mean, you have all the all the, the different. They are just very crucial for the other sectors, and as you say, the linkages between between them are important. But um, this leapfrogging, I also see quite quite questionable. Yeah, the, what which role services really have in, in structural transformation? I still think you also need productive manufacturing activities, um, but they are very much linked to service and also to to agriculture. Um, starting from also what what you, what what is there yeah? makes a lot of sense. Um, you, your second question, for, for sure, it's complex as as you also said with services. But um, I mean, I think there. I mean, and, and this is also something. I mean, I think most of you could from your country. I mean, could also. I think that's a big question we all should reply to. Yeah? I mean, there are so many issues we discussed. What do we see as as a priority? I mean. I can just say, for example, one example I, I have, I mean, I, I still think um, when it comes to manufacturing, there's a huge focus on global exports and foreign direct investment when you look at that government um, resources. And in many, in several of, of like, uh, um, um, of these projects, um, the potential role of, of local firms or local suppliers so that they can also get access is not really um, 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 looked at. Um, um, and I think, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, the need, I mean, I think locally and regionally embedded firms need to get more support um, than, 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 than foreign, foreign firms. Yeah? I mean, they all are, they all are different, yeah? but I think that's, that's one thing which, and it's not only local ownership. I mean, it's more about are they local or regionally embedded? Do they also source locally? Yeah? Do they have linkages locally? It's not really about the, the ownership or nationality questions. It's really more about um, the, 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 and, and what do they contribute to upgrading or, or skill development, um, et cetera. And I mean, for sure, the, I mean, and uh, also these things have to be negotiated. And in the, in the context of trade and, and also investment treaties, I mean, the policy room to negotiate issues like local or regional content or certain minimum share of local managers or learning or skill transfer, which I think is, is crucial, um, um, are somehow are more minimal. But I think there's still space. But individual African countries, for them, it's quite difficult. And we discussed this, this before. So for this, I think also regional integration and ideally also on a broader scale is really important important, and not only to negotiate uh, like trade agreements with the US and, 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 and Europe, but also the, the specific um, policy space within these, 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 these agreements. Um, so I think that's, the, that's just one point, but I think that's a, a big question. I mean, what are, what are the, the priorities? But an, another maybe also to start where you are, and I mean, man, many countries have agriculture and, and other resources. And uh, not only the processing side, which is for sure really important. One of you gave the example of coffee. 
I mean, there's um, many East African countries have coffee, um, and in Ethiopia, for example, there's still a very strong focus to export coffee to get for an exchange for other sectors. But there's also a huge local market, and I mean, if all East Africa say we process our coffee regionally and we only export um, processed coffee, I mean, the big international traders and retailers and coffee chains, I mean, that's they they can I mean they have to source from East Africa. So it's also a power question. So you can you could negotiate with them if you say, okay, we process it here. And it's not a techni technological issue. But also on the supply side, I mean, local suppliers, and there are big, big debates in, in, in like um, oil and, and, and hard commodities, but also in agricultural commodities. I think there's still much more room to, to use uh, and build linkages from, from agriculture and, and commodity, um, commodity sectors. Thank you. Uh, there was a question. At Introduce yourself and then. Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, My name is Mr. Ismail Hussein Finanga from the Ministry of Industry and Trade in the Republic of Tanzania. My question, Chairperson, goes to the same madam who has been talking about the issue of services. Yeah, he, she mentioned something about the focus on the services that produce value addition and the growth. Of course, she tried to explain a bit and the focus on the financial sector. Now, my question is that, okay, what is the gap from our experience, from our expertise? Where is the missing link? Because the financial sector for us at the regional level, of course, is a priority in the context of the common market protocol and is already opened. Again, under the SADIC is also a priority sector. We are almost finalizing the negotiations. So maybe I'd like to get from her what is her feeling, what is the missing link between this financial service so that at least it can give what she called value addition and growth. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, is is that uh, meant for for Martin? Uh, yes, please, Martin. Thank you. Again, um, I'm a little bit less familiar with the region, and I have to say, um, I, I have been involved quite closely with. Um, countries not too far from here, <laughs> with the SADC region. And actually that was a question that just came to my mind when we were just now talking about um, seeing the resource, the, the region as a, a common market. Um, that was a little bit my question because in terms of the trade negotiations, we just said now that some of these elements, investment and trade, have to be negotiated. Um, I would be interested in knowing if the region now is uh, really considering itself as a common market because my experience with the um, SADC region is that sometimes um, instead of um, providing a stepping stone, um, the regional negotiations can actually almost be an additional um, source of difficulty for the individual countries because there's still, um, at least at the beginning of the negotiations, there was still um, a sort of uh, what am I going to gain from um, uh, the, the liberalization in these markets? And of course we know that within um, the regions we have countries of uh, varying sizes with different uh, capabilities in the different um, uh, markets. So for example, obviously within the SADC region, um, there would be some concerns about a few of the SADC members who are already in terms of financial services already supplying um, the rest of the region. And um, I know that at least early on in the negotiations, this was um, seen in a sort of, a, certain of the other countries had a sort of a defensive um, position in terms of that. Now maybe because the EAC is uh, a bit more advanced, um, you have reached the stage where um, I don't know, um, nationals, whether in terms of uh, uh, corporations or persons, are considered nationals of the regions. And so we're just looking at um, the, whether um, the region is able to supply to the needs um, of the region. I don't know if I'm um, directly answering your question, but um, 
I, I would not be familiar with um, the development of financial services in the EAC region itself, but I just wanted to link that, um, and specifically because um, one of the, the, the things that we have been confronted in, in UNCTAD, and this is why, um, for, for example, this report calls for policy coherence between trade policy making at the different levels, is that actually um, we find it that it's still quite difficult for many of the African countries to identify how they can make coherent um, their ongoing um, trade policy objectives and negotiations, whether at the regional, this is COMESA, tripartite, and eventually uh, continental level, also um, make that coherent with what they're doing at the WTO uh, level. And at least with the countries that I'm a little bit more familiar with, this still is more of a challenge than um, really um, the bigger players being able to supply the region, this being seen as um, a benefit uh, let's say, to the firms or to the consumers. Um, I still find that um, in some countries there's quite a, still a, a defensive notion that we have our industries and your industries and that there's still maybe um, the attempt to promote domestic uh, local industry vis-a-vis -vis, um, what is still considered foreign. But again, um, maybe this is slightly different in the AC. I think that that's a very real issue, and we don't only see it here in regional integration and in Africa, but this is also a huge issue in the European Union. I mean, when it comes to, I mean, national interests are first, yeah, and we just saw this now recently in the in the crisis. Yeah? So I think, so I think this is a, a real political um, issue. I mean, how can national industrialization or economic development um, strategies be aligned with with regional um, integration? Um, I think one point, I mean, you had this discussion before, and I think we really should then, then open up to, was that, I mean, one issue is that some African countries are more open towards the European Union, for example, than towards other regional countries. I think this is, this is, this is an issue, yeah? and there, there are even the, um, the development levels are much more differentiated, yeah? and there is much more and, and competition than, than from, other, from other regional countries. Um, but, but I think it is an issue, and, but in the end, I mean, we also discussed that to be competitive, you need scale, you need certain linkages, you need specialization. So in the end, you, you need broader regional and um, production bases and also markets. Um, um, so, so I think it can be beneficial, but in the short term, for sure, if different countries want to develop their own textile industry or their own financial services industry, it's, it's a challenge, and this has to be, this has to be addressed cl clearly. But I think in the, in the long term, that's, that's necessary also to be globally competitive, because not every country can do all the steps, eh? um, and, and also for, 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 the, for the regional market. But it's a real, it's a real political issue. Sorry, if yes. I could just add, there's actually a chapter in this um, report, the, the one that's um, at the table, that focuses on financial services. And it's just come to me now that actually, um, at least for the authors, um, one of the um, points that they're making is that um, even when we move towards the African market, the market for financial services will not be large enough to have several um, regional leaders. And so at some point, um, there will be a first mover advantage. And we do have now certain um, sub-regional um, uh, leaders. Um, and so I guess the question remains to see um, eventually who will um, be able to, to take the lead. Um, but then maybe then we can also see uh, maybe how that um, financial services, we can maybe then segment um, what exactly do we mean by financial services? Are we looking to address the domestic needs or are we looking at some offshore activities, et cetera, et cetera? But there actually is a specific chapter in the report on this. Thank you. There was a question from the gentleman. Ambassador. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to take you back on the, on the question of service becoming a, a bigger factor in the gross, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the GNP, the gross domestic GDP. I think we have a, a phenomena where most people now still live in the rural areas in agriculture. But yet agriculture is forming a, a smaller part of the GDP. It is reducing its contribution to the GDP. Um, now we have people moving from the agriculture, going to town, to the cities. Now we have all these sprawling cities. Uh, now in Uganda, we call it, we call it the, the growth of a border-border economy. 
because what you're having, we're having a phenomenon of where people are selling land in the, in the, in the, in the, at the countryside, moving to, to cities where there's not enough jobs. And you have, as you said, they're in these low selling airtime, not actually serious services, but selling airtime. So they are marginal operators. Uh, so we, and that's why we're having a jobless growth and at the same time inequalities, not inclusive growth, even that as, as, you, as you see the, the, this growth. So the, maybe the question was, I wanted to ask, how can services be utilized to improve agriculture? Because everybody says, unless you, if you want to talk about the human development of Africa, of this region, you cannot do it by not uh, helping agriculture. So how can services be utilized to boost up that, 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 that sector? The question of finance, I agree. The other problem we have for the local entrepreneurs, at least in, I can talk about Uganda, is the cost of finance. Interest rates are so high that if you're going to get interest rate of about 30%, you cannot really be involved in, 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 as a serious investor because the cost of finance is very, very, is very, very high. And so there is need for a strategic intervention with regard to the cost of finance in respect of those developmental sectors. Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, you know, in in trying to address uh, this issue, I'm, I've seen a lot of interest uh, uh, in the issue of uh, of services, and we are having a whole dialogue uh, on services uh, beginning. Um, uh, 24th, uh, 25th, right here. So it's back to back. Uh, if if you are interested, uh, obviously you could you could follow that. But uh, to uh, to address your question, I mean, I I think that um, we we need to adjust how we we uh, formulate uh, policy. Yeah? Um, when you are looking at um, uh, services, you don't look at services as uh, independent from other sectors because services are complementary. Uh, they can be um, uh, tradable by themselves, but they can also be complementary to the, the, the goods uh, sector. Uh, for example, agriculture. Um, there's a lot of services that go into uh, agriculture sector. Uh, and therefore, uh, and uh, Cornelia has, has mentioned that in most cases, if you have to move uh, up the value chain, uh, you need uh, some degree of servicification in order to move up uh, the value chain. Uh, the financial services that you've talked about goes into the agriculture sector. So there are a lot of uh, supporting services that need to, uh, to support uh, the agriculture sector. But that speaking, it means that uh, one needs to do some sort of uh, sectoral study um, and look you know, this agriculture sector, particular agriculture sector, what are the, the barriers uh, that are preventing growth? What are the services that need to support that? So it's a very particular uh, sort of study that one needs to, uh, to undertake. Um, yes? Okay, my name is Francis uh, from ECDPM, European Center for Policy Management. My question is to Peter, because I needed some clarification on the electricity presentation that you just made. I remember Kenya signed a power purchasing plan with Ethiopia in 2012, and I just heard you say that Kenya has surplus electricity. I don't know if you can clarify on that. Thank you. Peter? Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's correct that uh, Kenya signed a power purchase agreement with Ethiopia. The Ethiopia-Kenya line is designed for 2,000 megawatts uh, transfer of energy, but the initial PPA is for 400 uh, uh, megawatts. And in the, in the projections of uh, the additional capacity within the within the economy, the the, the addition of 400 megawatt is part of that uh, uh, surplus that is uh, reflected. The demand projection for for Kenya is pegged to vision 
2030, which was uh, based on a 10% uh, GDP growth. And so the growth in uh, electricity demand has not grown at the rate that it was initially projected. As a result, the projects which were on stream have been commissioned and the demand has not matched uh, uh, that uh, projection. So that is why there is, a, uh, there is that uh, gap at the moment. Maybe I should take advantage to respond to the other questions that were raised. And uh, in fact, the first question raised was regarding the demand issue. The fact that uh, the region is uh, soon expected to going to have some surplus because the, there are projects that are under construction uh, for generation and transmission and, and so they are, they are already contracts are in place and so the projects will be uh, getting commissioned and so there will be some surplus demand. So there are efforts to promote uh, demand, uh, generation of demand in, in each, in each uh, country. Uh, some of these are promotion for investment development. Uh, Kenya, for instance, is promoting the development of industrial parks, for instance, in uh, Olkaria region, where the geothermal generation is located so that uh, investors can be supplied uh, with electricity from the source. And uh, if I'm not wrong, also the standard gauge railway is to be extended to those industrial parks as a way of uh, promoting this investment. Other partner states are, are doing similar promotion activities. At the same time, the EAC has an industrial policy and strategy which it is uh, currently implementing. And this involves a number of uh, uh, value chain activities. And this uh, policy is based on industries with competitive and comparative advantages. So for each country, the, 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 the focus on the, they'll focus on industries where they have comparative and competitive advantage. And these are expected to absorb some of the demand, extra demand that elect of electricity that is anticipated. But above all, the interconnection of the region within itself and with, without its, uh, outside itself, with the Southern Africa power pool and will uh, contribute, will constitute a, a market. And in this case, the strategy would be that uh, power purchase agreements would be anchored for long-term uh, recovery of the investment. But uh, beyond the, the energy beyond the power purchase agreement could be traded on the short-term electricity market within the power pool. So the interconnections will contribute, uh, will mitigate some of the uh, disadvantages of extra demand. But ultimately, the stimulating demand will be a critical issue that the governments have to, have to do. There were questions about the earlier pipeline study across Tanzania from Dar es Salaam uh, linking to Uganda. Yes, we are aware of that study. As time has uh, passed, some of the components will require updating. At the time, the study was focusing on import from the international market into Uganda. Now we are looking at uh, export from Uganda into Tanzania. So that will be a component that the current study will uh, uh, look at. On the natural gas pipeline, in fact, I coordinated that study. Uh, yes, it was done. Then 
and it found that the project is viable because there is a market for natural gas uh, in Tanga and in Mombasa. However, uh, the United Republic of Tanzania opted first to do a natural gas master plan before getting into, in order to inform its decision on how to deal with the natural gas discoveries. And uh, that has uh, taken precedent over the natural gas pipeline. But uh, eventually, uh, the focus of the natural gas master plan is first to add value, to use natural, the natural gas discoveries in Tanzania for domestic use and value addition before uh, going for the export option. And uh, that is why the natural gas pipeline from Dar es Salaam to Tanga and Mombasa has, uh, is somewhat on hold, but uh, not uh, thrown away. On the local content, uh, there was actually quite a heated discussion on this issue. And as you are aware, local content in itself, even within one country, is, is an issue. If you look at Mutuara, they, they look at the natural gas as the, they them, the people there are the local, are the local before even other parts of Tanzania. When you come to Kenya, the, the oil discoveries in Turkana, the people in Turkana see themselves as local and uh, before you even talk of any other Kenyans. And similarly with the Alberta and Graben uh, case in, in Uganda. And, and, and it's the case in different parts of the world. So what we agreed as a region is that we'll treat local content more like concentric circles. We start with the local people where the resource is found. If that particular service required is not available there, you go to the next tier within the country and eventually within the region and eventually outside the region. So that is the regional consensus on how to treat uh, local content. I think I will address the questions that were addressed to me. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting uh, mm -hmm. way of looking at uh, local content. Very innovative. Um, yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my comment is on value chains, so I guess uh, Cornelia could, uh, could respond. And I was thinking as uh, um, she spoke, and especially when she mentioned uh, the issue of, uh, of coffee, that if you look at uh, global value chains now, uh, and you ask yourself, where is the value you are talking about, then uh, it seems to me that more and more the value is in the intangibles that when you're actually manufacturing a product, the physical components, the actual manufacturing, at the end of the day, when you look at the um, consumer price of the product, uh, might just be a small um, proportion. And most of the, the value is in the intangibles, the, the branding, the marketing, the trademarks, the, uh, the patenting, and so forth. So how do we um, focus on getting a piece of, of that. Otherwise, we'll, if we were just entering um, the intermediaries and so forth, it'll be just a, a different um, sort of uh, the whole raw material um, export that we'll be getting uh, a small small portion of, uh, of the actual um, value. If you look at uh, coffee, with a country like Germany being the third largest uh, exporter in terms of value of, of coffee in the world, um, well yet it doesn't grow a single uh, coffee, coffee plant. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia has uh, the, the best uh, coffee, so it is said, um, which they could brand and sell at a, at a higher um, price. I don't know what your, what your comments would be on that. It's not really a Yeah, it's uh, something like moving me to ask a questions type of this. Um, what would you, uh, I mean, how do you see the impact, maybe sometimes negative impact of the global value chain on uh, developing regional value chain? Like, like right, he, rightly he mentioned now, um, coffee is already, or some commodities in fact, 
are already integrated into the global value chain. Um, raw material of coffee from Africa, let's say at large, uh, goes into, into high value markets, German or uh, Japan and the like. If a uh, regional East African, including Ethiopia for instance, if they try to roast here in, in, in East Africa, what immediately happens is a type of war against, uh, against uh, this attempt by the, the developed rosters, by putting so many direct or indirect type of barriers and the like to, to, to actually kill the, 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 the such strategy. So what, uh, what, do you what do you think on the, on the negative impact of promoting the regional uh, value chain? As one of the presenters this morning mentioned again, um, the emerging markets are always, these days especially, are uh, importing raw materials from Ethiopia, like, like from, from Africa as such, at large. And, 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 and the high value markets, developed markets are nowadays are more on value added uh, products marketing and by sending them back to us, cocoa or coffee, uh, uh, blended coffee and the like. So wouldn't be a problem or a, a, a big challenge for uh, the regional uh, value chain integration uh, and it wouldn't be a very I mean, problematic for even policy makers. Uh, how do you see that? I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the um, valued integration value chains is, is for sure not um, like a, a golden bullet uh, to, to, for development. Um, and um, I mean, many African countries are integrated in, in global value chains, specifically in commodity sectors. And um, the usual production um, process is that many inputs are imported or provided locally by, by, by foreign firms often, and then processing takes, takes, takes place abroad. Uh, and this is highly contested and uh, I mean um, if it's coffee in Ethiopia or cotton in other countries I mean many of these agricultural um, chains um, international traders have a crucial role I mean between producers as you know and consumers and they are only interested in sourcing unprocessed um, um, agriculture products and then export it globally so so that's that's their business and that's that's their interest um, so so that that's a challenge and there's strong path dependency um, because like in many products also there is no direct access to um, global markets so there is no marketing capabilities um, um, in locally or regionally um, in Africa um, but I think these are crucial questions and 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 like challenges that have to be, be dealt with. And I mean, one good example is like in Ethiopia, for example, for the coffee sector, when, when you established the uh, Ethiopian Commodity Exchange, I mean, the big international traders and buyers, they were totally against it. Eh? And they said they stopped sourcing from, from Ethiopia because they wanted to have the direct relationship to exporters. I mean, it's easier for them to do their own quality control, have the direct and not have a commodity exchange, where very transparently only local actors can trade. And then, so it, it changed the power as symmetry, at least partly, of a certain um, range of activities in the coffee sector. But the European government said, no, we, we do it. And the, firm, the, the buyer said they will leave, but they didn't leave. I mean, Ethiopian coffee, that's quite important. Eh? And I think it's, it's not easy, but I think for individual countries, it's much more difficult than for a region. So I think in these aspects, I mean, um, negotiating such political deals or so, if negotiations are taking place together, the, it is much more, more, more powerful. Eh? Um, and I totally agree. I mean, processing, um, and there, I mean, it, and it's interesting also that very often technological arguments are then politically used, <laughs> that you cannot roast it in Africa and then export it. I mean, for some products that's true, but for others it's really also a, a debate you, 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 you are having. And um, um, so, yeah. so so. There is certain past dependency, specifically integration in um, commodity or agri agricultural value chains where African countries are integrated in a manner where there are limited upgrading possibilities in the current mode of integration. And I think some of these chains are not very sustainable. And the question is, is there, can there new chains developed or can there be shifts to, to, to other markets? I mean, um, the, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a complex issue. 
Um, to, for coffee, I mean, I would generally agree that 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 um, important value added takes place in intangibles and also also services, different types of services, but certain services like on the on the like specifically retailing, branding, and marketing. But specifically, coffee and um, is normally um, described as a bi or tripolar value chain because you have um, you have the international traders that are quite powerful, the roasters, um, and then at the end the supermarkets or the or, or the retailers. And I think roasting is is still quite quite um, an imp an important part of of, of value addition. So it's not just the supermarkets or the retailers. So I think if you had in East Africa more roasting activity, I think it would be an, an, important, an, an important step. But the other question is, as, as in Ethiopia, I mean, now there is also more roasted coffee sold because you, I think you cannot do the roasting anymore if you live in a city and, and it's much more difficult. And also in other countries in Africa, there is a small coffee tradition um, developing. And who will sell this coffee? I mean, are these regional supermarkets or, or global ones? I mean, these, so, so there is a possibility even beyond roasting to, to, to go into, into branding, marketing, um, and, and retailing. Um, but for this, for sure, you need knowledge, skills, certain capabilities, that's, that's, and they are quite different than producing coffee. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. But maybe just, maybe yes. one more point. I think there are some easy fruits you can pick. Like for example, in certain sectors, like the case I work of the apparel. I mean, for example, the regional value chains, a main concern for these buyers is that there's no regional textile sector. So, so th or that there's no regional, at least certain packaging or certain activities. So there are certain areas where there are clear um, um, common interests between lead firms and suppliers and national development strategy. Um, and also like supporting certain SMEs to integrate in, in certain service areas. So I think even so some areas are contested if it goes really into, into core activities of lead firms. Um, in other areas there are win-wins. Um, and I think you could have a double strategy. First, try to improve these areas and try to use these upgrading and value adding possibilities where there are win-wins and where lead firms support um, this upgrading process. But then in certain areas also figure out, okay, there are certain global value chains where the integration is not very beneficial. And um, there are questions how you can negotiate it and change this type of integration or also try to shift to, 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 other, to, other, to other markets if, if this is possible. So I think, yeah, you have these two, two possibilities. Further, any further contributions, uh, please? Thank you. Just in relation to the discussion that we have now with regard to this coffee roasting and so on, what would be the impact of shifting the traditional trade partnership to the modern, the growing uh, and, uh, and developing uh, countries? And earlier you mentioned in the morning that there is a general trend where the African countries have now trying to have another alternative corridor for trade, meaning that they shifted from the traditional partner to the new emerging market. So would that help, I mean, to address some of these issues, I mean, by bringing in the competition and, uh, and, uh, and related? Uh, I think potentially this could importantly help. And I mean, I have to cite like Mike Morris, my, my close colleague and friend who always says, China has a clear strategy for Africa, but Africa does not have a clear strategy for China. But you definitely need this. Um, and I think it's, it's a very different, specifically during the commodity price boom, but also now. I mean, there, there's much, as we discussed, there's much more interest in African markets, but also in African resources, commodities. Europe, US, Latin America, India, China. I mean, we named all, all these, these different um, countries and, and companies. So for sure, there's a much better opportunity now to negotiate better deals on a firm level. Um, to discuss like from, but also supported by the government um, um, to ensure um, that, that there, are, there are trade rules, but that there's also like higher value addition. So I think that's a great opportunity, but it's difficult when we look at these power asymmetries, which we also discussed in trade negotiations for individual countries. So I think it would be much more, um, yeah, better possibility to do it regionally or for, for, for all Africa together. So I think it's a great, great opportunity, but Africa needs a strategy how to use China, because they have a clear strategy and they do it in their interest. But they are also prepared to do compromises if they have to, because it's too important mm -hmm. to get access to markets and to get access to resources from here. Thank you, Cornelia. Um, 
Yes, here. Yeah. No, no, I've been. Oh, yeah. You go ahead. Then the gentleman at the back. Is it Francis? Uh, uh, just a, a small question to Peter. Um, we have seen the importance of energy. Um, how we can use, how can we use that energy to energize the rural economy for development. In most African countries, the rural economy makes a lot of difference in economic growth. Obviously, we are more agricultural based. We talked, you talked about, uh, uh, we talked about the rural energy programs. Um, they, they are very poor people. They cannot afford uh, paying for electricity, uh, let alone the uh, extension from the grid extension. From the costs of grid extension, uh, even the independent, the, 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 the independent power uh, sources that perhaps may be a little cheaper. Is there a way we can see the differential uh, in terms of helping them to develop so that the economy can grow by looking at a more special tariff set for them vis-a-vis -vis the commercial type of tariffs you see in the cities or in more developed uh, areas. Uh, I think that was one of the reasons why we are talking about rural electrification programs. Now, how do we look at that as a form, source, a sort of uh, a subsidy to, to bridge the gap, enable them to develop? Because without looking at the integrating the rural energy in terms of modernizing their, their development programs, it will be very difficult. We will be actually working on two different uh, communities. So you have the more developed communities in the cities, the more developed community, the commercial se sector, and then you leave these, which are essentially the most important uh, contributor to our, to our economies. How can we look at it? Because it will definitely be an important aspect of regional integration, and also developmental aspects that we are conceiving. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Indeed, the rural electrification or rural people, sometimes generally they are not able to afford the connection rates that uh, that uh, cover the costs for doing that connection. So in, uh, in general, there has been a uh, subsidy on that side. Nearly all the partner states, uh, first of all, they have, uh, they have a lifeline tariff for across the board for, for, for low, low income, for poor people, basically. Uh, a certain level of uh, the first, uh, say, 50 units of electricity consumed are charged at uh, what we normally call the lifeline tariff. And once uh, a consumer then consumes more than that, then the, the tariff rises significantly to compensate for this, uh, for, for, for those who are at the lifeline tariff. To extend the program, uh, in, in general there is, a, for every consumer there is a, rural electrification levy, which goes towards the development of uh, the rural electrification infrastructure. But the, the main, but, but those, those, uh, those incentives still require additional input, additional incentives, and the uh, government sometimes have to come directly to finance the infrastructure for, for, for electrification and they call upon also development partners who contribute towards uh, uh, these uh, activities. But there are, there are still no easy answers. It has to be addressed holistically from poverty, uh, poverty eradication, poverty reduction uh, programs beyond the, the energy sector. Because once you address then that energy, uh, poverty, uh, poverty issues, then you raise the affordability. But for each uh, country now, there is a move not to, 
deny connection for lack of uh, connection fees. So there are different uh, modalities for going around that by maybe extending uh, a loan that is paid through the tariff uh, or through the, the monthly bills, uh, things like that that enable uh, them to have a, a softer way of being able to address the electrification process. For sure, the government will normally electrify the nearest uh, public facilities, the, the hospitals, the schools, the, the, the public uh, areas, and then uh, extend this to the domestic people. So at least they still have the access. Within the East African community, we ended up differentiating electricity access and connectivity level. And uh, this has helped us to see that uh, there may be high access but low connectivity. And uh, then the, the gap, the reducing the gap between access and uh, connectivity then invites the policy interventions and the causes uh, uh, decision makers then to think, why do we have high access? High access basically means uh, you are close to, you can connect, but you are not yet connected. But when you are physically connected, then we count that as connectivity. And that's, this has helped to inform some of the programs you see in the region of enhancing uh, connectivity levels, such as uh, standardizing the, the rates for all the customers who are within a certain distance from, from the transformer that is required to supply them, and so on. So, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> those are some of the things that we have done. We have defined access as anybody within 600 meters from a transformer to which they can be connected, whether they are connected or not. And connectivity as those who have actual connection. They can switch on a, a switch in their, in their house or in their facility. And if there is a, then if access is not equal to connectivity, then there is a room for uh, taking some actions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hosina, you wanted to add to that? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to, 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 to support his view because uh, t two months ago the ADB uh, did some assessment because they were supporting Tanzania for, in rural electrification. And I think his concern is, is right in the sense that uh, they agreed with the government to reduce the connection charge in the towns, you know, almost $200. So they reduced it to, to $10, $15 for rural or households. Um, and, 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 and yet, uh, actually some of them in some areas, they followed your example that you can actually connect for free and then you can be paying later. But they, 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 I went to Shinyanga, Mwanza area. Now the villagers are saying, you see, it's one thing, even if you brought that wire to my door, I need another $200 to do the wiring and the bulbs, the holders. <laughs> so I think the, 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 the recommendations we made were that uh, Perhaps you need to, uh, villages need to set aside some areas for, for, for industrial, industrial parks, even villages, so that the investors can come and set up processing, agro-processing, and they get jobs. Once they have jobs, now they will have money even to do the wiring, because otherwise you can't uh, do wiring all the houses. In the, in the, yeah. So I think that was one of the recommendations we came with, that maybe it's high time, even the villages, they set aside some areas, so that if there's ele electricity coming, the priority, as you say, you can start with the schools, boarding schools, hospitals, and the industrial parks, village industrial parks. People can get employed, they get money now to, you know, to wire their houses, because even if you gave them for free to connect, they still need to, have, to buy bulbs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a question from the back there, then uh, Lucas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wanted to make two uh, remarks, if it's possible. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, this discussion, okay, the presentations and the discussion 
are very rich. But I've been sitting here and wondering, how exactly are we going to use this information? Could someone from my CTSD and the, perhaps the University of Nairobi, I can see they have a, a logo here as well, tell us how this is going to be used? How, how does this now, the, does this actually reach policy formulation and policy implementation at governmental level? Or does it just stop in this room? So can, can someone tell us how this, whether this is going to uh, uh, feed into policy formulation? Because this is really important information we, we are he hearing or receiving here. So that's the first uh, remark I wanted to make. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's possible to make a comment on it, uh, I'll be happy to hear what, uh, how we are going to take this forward. Then the second one, and it comes from the example which Cornelia gave about what has happened in Ethiopia. Um, I think it would be useful if, uh, as an area for maybe further work, if it's possible, to give some priority, some priority to uh, practice. Can we, in these presentations, uh, or, or in some write-ups, whatever it is, try to give some prominence to examples of success stories? For instance, we are talking about uh, value chains, you know, these the, this, uh, trade is governed, there are lead farms and things like that. This, uh, they, they seem, uh, in, you know, you, you can't actually penetrate, you know, their networks unless uh, uh, probably you do something which uh, we, we still have to work out what it is. And it, be, it, be, it, it sounds alarming. It sounds as if we are, we are stuck, you know, yeah, unless uh, we figure out how to break through these uh, networks. But uh, I know for a fact that there are many success stories, even in Africa here. For instance, in Botswana, I think the, these Canadians were telling Botswana people that you can't cut diamonds in Botswana. If you do that, we shall leave. That's what these powerful companies were, doing, were saying. Then Botswana went ahead and enacted the law, saying you have to do it here. The, 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 these uh, companies didn't leave. They didn't leave because they were going to lose you know, access to these diamonds. And as a result of, uh, of that, introducing this uh, just simple you know, polishing, cutting and, uh, of, of diamonds, the economy actually got a lot of money. There was a lot of money that uh, remained on in the economy and lots of jobs that uh, were created. So there are many examples like this all over Africa. I think even in East Africa here, I was wondering how Rusagara is now doing with his specialty coffee. Uh, you know, we, we, we are supposed to have, have actually quite uh, some success stories. Uh, and these stories can be inspirational, or they can be case studies, examples for people who want to do uh, likewise. Um, it's just a suggestion I wanted uh, to make, so that we, I am guilty of it as well, so that we put less emphasis on theory and things like that, and more emphasis on practice, on examples, on what has worked. In this country here, there's a company called Homegrown Limited. I think it is still there. No, it's not, it's, it's not there. That company sells vegetables to the UK and I think to other countries. And, and the, the system it put in place is to train out growers, farmers, small farmers, provide them seeds, inputs, packaging material as well. So the products come from the farms straight onto the flights and straight onto the shelves in London in the supermarkets in London. Now, this has been working for a very long time, and it, and it actually is documented as well. So I wanted to suggest that perhaps examples like this could, could, could be helpful to us in dealing with some of these uh, apparently insurmountable uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. I, I think that um, um, we, we, we owe you an explanation as ICTSD uh, on where we are taking this. Um, this uh, this discussion uh, is uh, a second uh, in the series uh, of uh, discussions uh, on regional integration. We did have um, uh, another dialogue uh, in South Africa uh, in July. Um, now we we have a long term uh, view on 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 a project on regional integration, uh, but at the same time we have. Uh, two other projects as ICTSD, one on, uh, on value chains and another one on, on services. 
our view is that uh, eventually what we need to do is to have a comprehensive approach where these projects are given a long-term um, um, coherence so that we can, we can see how value chains can improve deeper regional integration uh, and also considering the, um, the complementary services that go into those value chains. So for us, um, that is the, the long-term view we are taking. But we will not just leave it at understanding um, uh, what uh, the regional challenges uh, and, and uh, opportunities are. We want to, after identifying the, the value chains and where the, the various players are, we want to go to those players and see the barriers that they may have, the difficulties that they may have, and propose options uh, of policy change or whether it's regulatory change and so forth so that uh, uh, these value chains can be enhanced that are existing or identify new value chains that can be developed in order to um, um, deepen regional integration. So we shall uh, obviously be um, uh, interacting with uh, policy makers at some stage at a very specific level. Um, yes. I, I'm sorry, but if I can just make a follow, a quick follow-up, then, then uh, that's really brilliant. So then, uh, one suggestion in addition to those good things you are going to do, uh, since the EAC is sitting next to you there, and there are other RECs, I think in Africa as well as the African Union, can can you find a way of uh, getting some of these things to be on the agenda of uh, the policy organs or the meetings of the ministers of these uh, 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 meetings? Well, I know for sure that in commerce it's possible. I think in the EAC it's also possible. Where then you as ICTSD go and make a presentation at that level on, on your work, on what you have come up with, and uh, interest, you know, these uh, policymakers and probably the private sector operators as well. EAC has got the East African Business Council. Uh, commerce has got the Commercial Business Council. Maybe, as you're saying, these are the sort of people who would be recipients of, the, of this. Uh, but thank you very much for that information you have given. Thank you. I, I would ask uh, Andrew uh, Crosby, who is uh, the Managing Director for Communication and Strategy at ICTSD, to, to supplement what I said. Thank you, Darlington. So, good question. Uh, just to add to what you said, so part of, the, part of the principle of these dialogues is that all of you have your own power and you are policy influencers. Uh, and so when we bring groups like this together, we expect that you will go back into your own realms and have influence. So, so in general, we do not carry out consensus seeking processes because we find a lot of value in the, in the digging up, uh, in the interaction, uh, certainly not preventing um, initiatives to form, but, but our position is that actually the part of the value here is that we can have a discussion that's not based on generating consensus in the room, but that may well um, result in some alignment among the people who are there. Um, so as Darlington says, this, this, is, this is likely to go on in the kinds of processes that we do. This meeting is one of a series. So we were just here uh, three months ago working on agriculture, and we had some, also some great people in the room, and some of that will go back there. Now, some of those go into the regional processes. They're brought into the regional processes. We have people from EAC and, and others of the RECs from UN agencies. Um, you know, and from, uh, from other governments from time to time. So, so we hope that that actually feeds back in as we come into those processes. Let me just, I, I would just, if I can abuse the, the opportunity uh, since I have the floor, because I think this um, discussion on the value chains is fascinating, uh, really interesting. Actually, I think this is one that uh, really needed to happen. And what I'm appreciating uh, is that we're, coming from a place, uh, after I heard Cornelia speak, I thought, well, these things are just as competitive as they could possibly be. So in a way, you're painting a picture of, uh, of, of a much more difficult market situation. And, and I think that's a, a, an interesting thing. That's a market situation. So how do, how do, uh, how do countries respond to that? Um, and I think that's what we're struggling through in the conversation. 
Um, so part of that has to do with the infrastructure, right? Part of it has to do with the roads, the electricity, uh, the financial, uh, financial infrastructure, and so on. Uh, and part of it has to do with innovation. So part of what Peter was telling us about was the regional inter interconnection standards, for example, is one way of creating an infrastructure that makes it easier to interact, to develop business, and so on. On the innovation side, the question is what can you do to build both domestic innovation or bring it in through investment? That's a strategy. Uh, so I think we're, I mean, for, for me, the, the summation of this, and this is not a conclusion yet, but it's exactly the kind of conversation that needs to happen. Is this about industrial policy as it was, or is this about the policy that needs to be in, a, in an era that is characterized by a much higher level of competitiveness, uh, more difficult markets, but also opportunities in terms of how you, how you um, envision domestic uh, and regional change. Where does the innovation come from? And I think that's part of what this is about. So thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing a little extra comment. Thank you. Uh, Lucas? Chair, um, I, I'm sorry for bringing you back to the issue of coffee, which I commented upon this morning. And it will appear we are having, we are having a fear of, of the unknown. We have had fear of the unknown. We have heard from Cornelia uh, commenting on what happened in Ethiopia. They were told that uh, they, were they, 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 they were discouraged, but yet the way they went on, and it is accepted. Adding, adding value to coffee, of course, our adding value to any product has been meeting what we call tariff escalation. It has been there. And we have been negotiating under WTO to remove such kind of, uh, of move without even uh, succeeding so far. So what we are saying, we should draw a line. We should, have, we, 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 we should give it a try. We add value. And in that case, we are creating jobs to our people. We are, we are, we are industrializing, and so on and so forth. We understand, of course, member states will be lobbied, will be divided, just like it happened to the issue of LDC and how they were trying to, to divide, divide LDC members. That uh, if, you allow the, if you allow the duty free quota free market access to all LDC member countries, then it, it's a recipe for some LDCs to die. And, I mean, such things. What happened? Let me give you an example to Tanzanite, which is ob obtained in Tanzanite, uh, in Tanzania only. There was a move to, 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 to polish Tanzanite to introduce lapidary industries in, in Arusha. And this was discussed even at the level of the parliament. But still, you were having members of parliament who, who were for it, and you have members of parliament who are trying to fight against it. This is natural. So this also, this, this move we are trying to introduce, we'll be having, we, we, we are going to be used, member, individual member countries are going to be used, but where do they get coffee? There is not just a question of saying, okay, we don't need your coffee. If you don't need your coffee, we have some other markets which I think we can try and obtain, uh, of, uh, and obtain market. And suppose the same is, is applied by countries which are exporting coffee like Vietnam and what have you. At least this is the move which, which I was trying to comment upon this morning. So Mr. Chairman, we should, not, we should find a remedy to our, this issue of exporting raw materials ourselves. The, the remedy, when we are having a headache, the remedy is not to chop off your head but to give, to give the right medicine. And this is what uh, I thought it would be a right, a right medicine. Now, I, I, I totally support Dr. Francis on what he's saying. After here, what, what we do. So I think you have, uh, I think you have explained very well that uh, we have to try to make sure that the policy makers get what we are trying to get from this uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Lucas, uh, following up on that, I mean, you, you talked about coffee and uh, 
roasting and leading to tariff escalations, but you've signed an EPA, so you have a solution, at least for Europe. Yeah, it, it is very inter it is in very interesting that uh, we have signed an EPA, and this is I wouldn't like to comment because uh, you you understand where I'm coming from, and I was very against this EPA, but I don't like to to to, to continue comment. I I, I I I I talked to you this afternoon, and what happened, and this is the, but certainly we have a problem, and this is what I, I was saying. While we are, we are talking of uh, uh, regional integration, while we are talking of uh, even exporting to the EU market, this is not going to, we are not going to get the preferences which we have been told. If other issues that we were telling Europe are not addressed by the issue of subsidies, the issues of, of uh, the issues of uh, allowing us to, to, to continue with the export taxes, the issues related to the MFN, MFN uh, uh, principle and so on and so forth. Certainly, we, 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 we have a problem. And this is what is going to come. The USA is also is, is, is coming and say, OK, if we are able to give uh, a duty free quota free market access to EU, why not us? So this is, we should be prepared for that kind of uh, um, 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 development in the, in, the, in the short distant future. Colleagues, uh, I, I think that uh, we have uh, done uh, this day a lot of justice, um, and we have had a very uh, positive uh, uh, interaction. I could uh, bore you uh, and uh, give you a summary of, of the day, but I won't do that, uh, because I think that uh, we have had a very interesting uh, exchange, and so I do not want to uh, to error by uh, taking away from, from that uh, positive uh, interaction. Uh, at this stage, uh, I, I want to, to, to um, sincerely thank you for, uh, for your attendance and participation uh, uh, on the first day. Uh, we have uh, um, an agenda for, for tomorrow, uh, which uh, of course uh, opens uh, at 8.30 with uh, arrival tea. And then we have uh, session three, uh, which is making sense of multiple trade integration opportunities. Uh, I think this is going to be very uh, interesting because uh, we will we, we'll look at uh, uh, the various uh, 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 trade uh, arrangements we have, ESC, Africa, and so forth, and see what are the opportunities that are there, what are the challenges that are there, how do we uh, overcome these. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very uh, important because uh, there's been a multiple uh, uh, trade arrangements that uh, Africa has entered into. But uh, before we get to tomorrow, um, um, is there any f uh, announcements uh, for, for reception and uh, dinner, um, Deborah? Yes, indeed. You know, there's no rest for the wicked. So in about uh, 15 minutes, we will uh, serve some drinks in the Taifa room, which is just around there, and a dinner, an animated dinner, where you'll be asked to participate in an exercise, not physical, will start at about 6.30. This is in room Taifa, just around the corner there. So we suggest you take 15 minutes to stretch your legs, breathe, make your phone calls, and then we convene for drinks. Thank you. Thank you very much.